Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. That morning's call took Nick by surprise. When he saw the name of the caller, he became alarmed. Yes, Vincent here. Is something wrong? Has Naley gotten worse? Do you want to make a will? What, for two people at once? What's the rush? No, I'm sorry, of course, but I think it's a little early, to say the least. There was a tense pause, after which the interlocutor made it clear to Nick that the decision was final and irrevocable. Okay, I'll be there. Yeah, in about an hour and a half. Tell Naley not to worry. I'll be there on time, Nick replied, giving his voice the impartiality it needed, and disconnected the call. He did not want to go to McCullough, especially on such a sad occasion, and the young notary had a good reason for that. Nick worked in the notary office for the fifth year and never regretted that he had connected his life with law. By his 35, he had everything that many of his peers could not dream of a nice house, an expensive car, and a favorite job. What else do you need? True, there was one painful topic that Nick did not like to talk about. And that topic was family. Two years ago, Nick divorced his wife, who chose his best friend as a lover. Since the couple had no children, the divorce was almost painless. A man he was not greedy and at parting did not leave his former wife in poverty. Of course, deep down he was very sorry for the aimlessly lived years. On the other hand, any experience. After all, he, as you know, teaches well, but takes dearly. Putting aside sad thoughts, Nick began to get ready for work. A visit to McCullough's house would take him at least two hours of valuable time, and lawyer's time was worth its weight in gold. Taking with him a leather briefcase with everything he needed, Vincent headed for the car parked outside the house. The luxury foreign car looked magnificent, especially in the shy spring sunlight. Nick was about to get into the car when someone tugged gently on his coat sleeve. He turned his head to the left and saw a boy of about seven or eight holding a crumpled sheet of paper in front of him. What do you want, buddy? Money? I'll just get my purse, Nick fussed, putting his hand into his pocket. No, uncle, I don't want any money. You'd better give the note to the aunt you're going to see. Only from hand to hand. In person, the boy asked insistently. Nick raised his eyebrows in surprise. So much for the morning meeting. What does this kid mean? Did he really know Naley McCullough? Seeing the doubt in the notary's eyes, the boy added, don't you think I'm telling the truth? And I know Aunt Naley, and my mother too, met her in the park during a walk. Mother? Who's your mother, Nick, asked with unconcealed irony. Catching the mockery in the man's voice, the boy sniffed resentfully, my mom's my fortune teller. She sees everything. She has a gift. She can see into the future. And then what she sees, she writes it down on a piece of paper and gives it to the person to whom the prediction is addressed. Nick whistled in surprise and shook his head. Wow. What a busy start to the day. Fortune tellers, predictions. What on earth was going on? It wouldn't hurt if he just handed the note to the addressee, though. Let Naley decide what to do with the information. Confident that his conclusions were correct, the notary took the crumpled sheet and tucked it into his coat pocket. All right, I'll do it all. Keep in mind I'm taking the note without reading its contents, so hopefully there's nothing wrong with it. I'd hate to look foolish in the eyes of a client. The little boy's cheeks flared with embarrassment. Oh, really? 
How can you do that? I would do anything for Aunt Maylie. And this note is very important and necessary. All right, all right, I believe it. All right, bye. I'm sorry, I have to go. The boy nodded and, after seeing the car drive away with his eyes, went home with a sense of accomplishment. While Nick was thinking about the case of the boy's mysterious note, his McCullough clients were going about their lives. Unlike the previous days, today Naley woke up quite early. When illness overtakes, not everyone can sleep well. The woman sighed sadly and went to the window. It was freezing at night. The quiet and cozy yard of their house was covered with fallen leaves. The end of autumn and the breath of approaching winter was felt by everyone in the city. The mood was depressed. The treatments were still not working. Her husband, Vincent, convinced her otherwise. Honey, you have to be patient. Here is a new drug began to use, and the doctors do not give up hope. Sam says the treatment is making progress. There was a look of doubt on Maylie's face. Progress? How could he be making progress? A private doctor would say a lot of things to support a patient and keep the truth from him. But she felt it was different. But who but she should know the peculiarities of her own body? What's there to say? Naley had shown signs of a formidable ailment about two months ago. At first it was just a malaise, nausea in the morning. Dizziness interfered with work and generally suggested pregnancy. But when Naley bought the tests, everything immediately fell into place. There was no pregnancy at all. However, the woman herself was not surprised. Because the McCulloughs were not destined to have children. Vincent, as usual, did not believe in his wife's premonitions, considering her an alarmist and easily suggestible person. It's easy for you to reason, isn't, isn't it? It's not you who's going through a pregnancy breakdown, it's me. It's just awful. It's like a piece of you is being torn away and never coming back, Nailey objected. Vincent shook his head. In his mind, any problem could be solved with money. Big or small, of course, it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was desire. No children. Is that a reason to be sad? You can try IVF treatment. And if it doesn't work out, it's no big deal. Unfortunately, no matter what the couple did, the desired pregnancy never came. Deep down, Naley realized that if it hadn't been for that fatal accident on the road, things might have been very different. If Vincent hadn't been speeding, he would have seen the lone pedestrian and slowed down in time. But that's not what happened. No, nothing irreparable happened, at least for the pedestrian. Vincent swerved the steering wheel and avoided the collision by flying out onto the sidewalk. Fortunately, there were few people around at the time and no casualties. There were casualties, though. And Naley was the first to feel it, her lower abdomen cramping violently. Second month of pregnancy. And here's the bottom line. Emergency hospitalization, tears, hysterics. Vincent, of course, tried to justify himself by saying it was just an accident. But according to Naley, when you can't get pregnant for a long time and finally get what you want, there can't be any accidents. This happened two years ago. Seems like yesterday. Of course, Naley forgave her husband. But how could she not, when she loved him with all her heart? As she listened to Vincent's excuses this morning, she sensed that he was obviously not telling her something. But why am I being treated at home? Why don't they give me a room at Sam's clinic? What kind of treatment is it when the doctor sees the patient once a week? What about daily rounds? Checkups Vincent's face finally changed. Naley, what's wrong with you? You don't need this hospital regimen. It's last century, for God's sake. At home, the walls heal, you know. 
and the fact that the doctor comes once a week is a good thing. Sam's got it under control, and he keeps a personal record of your medical history. Vincent said. Maley looked carefully into his eyes and saw nothing in them, no fear, no sympathy, nothing at all. He looked at her as if she were a marble statue, not a living person. And Maley sensed that her husband was obviously hiding something. But what? What was he talking about in the study with Sam for so long? Was it really that bad? Why not just face the truth? Face the facts and come clean. In Maley's mind, that would be a lot more honest than giving her delusions. Sighing sadly, she went to the kitchen, but Vincent intercepted her at the door. Where do you think you're going? What if you get sick on the stairs or in the kitchen? No, no, no. I'll cook it myself and bring it to you. Maylie looked sadly at her husband. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your concern, but I want to make my own tea and breakfast. I want to feel like a woman again, not a bedridden sick woman. Vincent nodded understandingly and put his arm around her shoulders, of course. Nayli, you're right. I'm sorry I wasn't thinking. Let me help you downstairs. A happy smile played on Nayli's lips. What a caring husband she had. He would sacrifice everything for her. When she entered the kitchen, she glanced around and closed her eyes blissfully. As usual, it smelled of cinnamon and vanilla, which she loved. In fact, cooking was everything to Nayli. As a wealthy woman, she could dine in restaurants and cafes every day, but she still liked to make her own dishes, the kind that would make her drool and make her dizzy. Pancakes, buns, fritters Nayli knew it all, as well as anyone. She mixed the batter herself and stood at the stove, even now, from time to time, she found the strength to make something tasty for her husband. Naturally, Vincent was against it. Nayli, but you have to take care of yourself. The kitchen can wait. Trust me, it won't be a big deal if I buy food at the store or order delivery from a restaurant. That's when you'll delight me with your culinary masterpieces. Nayli nodded in agreement and almost lost her balance when she felt a bout of dizziness. That's what I'm talking about. Sit down, get some rest. Sam called, said he'd be late today. And I called the notary, Vincent said, and began fussing over his wife. A notary. Why, Nayli wondered. Vincent hesitated for a moment, then came at the question from a distance, why? so that if anything happens, the firm won't be left without management. After all, it feeds us and keeps us out of medical expenses. You know that good drugs cost a lot of money nowadays. Nayli looked at her husband anxiously. What do you mean by in case of emergency? What's that supposed to mean? Have you buried me already? He lowered his eyes bashfully, realizing he had said too much. No, Nayli, I haven't, of course not. I don't even think about it. It's just that things happen in life. You know that as well as I do. Treatment can take a long time and we can't take away the company's management. You're technically the owner of the company. And you're the one who makes all the decisions. So I'm trying to think two steps ahead. There was resentment in Vincent's voice. Nayli sensed it immediately. Why was she getting so worked up about this notary? In fact, her husband was right. Sickness was sickness. But business had to move forward, not stand still. I'm sorry, Vincent, you're right. Let him come, but only in the morning, okay? I've been feeling a little dizzy since the meds. I think handing over the reins of the firm at a time like this would be the right thing to do. Nayli said, letting her husband know that she was willing to make concessions. Well, that's great. Glad you heard me, honey. I was starting to feel a little awkward. And I've sketched out a few things in my will just in case. 
Melee, don't think anything bad. So that you don't feel so sad, let's do it together. After all, we're wealthy people. We can't just let things go. Vincent said it in a voice so casual, so devoid of intonation, that Maley felt uneasy. Was it possible to speak so calmly and coldly about such unpleasant things? When Vincent caught the change in her mood, he changed the subject with the virtuosity of a talented magician. In spite of all his tricks, Maley still felt a lingering residue. She looked out the window, watching the leaves swirling in the wind, creating whimsical images of yellow and red. Involuntarily, Nayli remembered how she had ventured out for a walk in the park a month ago. She had met a woman fortune teller. She was in her early thirties, maybe a little older. At first glance, not everyone could recognize her as a fortune teller. Ordinary modest clothes, no gypsy outfits or voluminous dresses. A dress in a small flower, a purse on her shoulder and a notebook in which the fortune teller wrote down what she saw in the future clients. This was the first time Nayli had encountered such a method of divination. Usually all sorts of healers and mediums like to put on fog and other mystical tinsel, but here everything happened quite differently. The fortune teller approached only those whom she herself had chosen from the general mass and, touching her hands, said what she saw. At the same time, she behaved calmly, confidently, as a true professional of her work should. Nayli could not be more precise about her age because of the shawl that covered the woman's head. She approached Nayli on her own, as if she sensed the call for help coming from her though at that moment Nayli felt much better than she did now. I see something is troubling you, the stranger said first. Nayli timidly looked up and noticed a boy of about seven or eight years old hovering near the fortune teller. A son, I suppose she thought at once. But she answered the question nevertheless. Yes, you are right. I am worried. I am seriously ill, it seems and the treatment does not help. Although maybe it all seems to me only to me. The companion gently touched Nayli's hand and then said, changing the conversation to you. I see you're dreaming of children and that's your main problem. But with that man with whom you have tied your life, you will never have children. Such an unpleasant truth made Nayli uncomfortable Yes, you're right. It really is like that. But how do you know? The fortune teller hesitated for a moment, then said simply, I see. It is my cross to bear for the rest of my life. Nayli reached for her purse, but the fortune teller gently withdrew her hand. No need, I'll make do. I don't take money from people. That's not good. Just groceries and there's no need to thank me. Nayli was confused and froze with her purse in her hands. You need to think about your health and take a closer look at your surroundings, the fortune teller added. At first, Nayli thought that the fortune teller worked according to a well-established scheme, selecting from the crowd of passers by those from whom she could extract more profit. Take her, for example. You can see that Nayli is young and in the park walks by herself without a child. So there's a good chance there's a problem with that. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out the root of the problem. Nayli would never have believed the fortune teller if she charged her for her services, but she refused. She also hinted at problems with her inner circle. What does she mean by that? On that warm September day, Nayli thanked the fortune teller, but she did it through her son. Calling the toddler over to her, she pointed him to the bakery stall and asked with a smile, How do you feel about having lunch? The boy looked furtively at his mom and then said, Yeah, I don't mind, actually. Just don't go to waste on me. 
One bun and juice will be enough, if you can have it orange-flavored. Naily smiled. As of late, socializing with small children had brought her peace of mind and satisfaction. Well, let's go, if Mommy doesn't mind, Naily said, and headed towards the nearest kiosk. Mom doesn't mind, the fortune teller replied after her, bringing a smile to Naily's face. Of course, she bought a lot more than the boy had asked for. As it turned out a little later, his name was Andrew, and his mom was Martha. The fortune teller did not join the meal, leaving her son together with Naily on the bench. She herself stood a little farther away, giving advice to another client. Your mom is serious, and she seems to have a special gift. I've never seen anything like it, Naily said casually. Andrew nodded and chewed a piece of bun and drank a good sip of juice. Yeah, my mom's great. Everything she says comes true. It's a pity she can't tell herself anything, she says. Sees only for strangers. Naily looked at the boy with a smile. So small, and yet he talks like an adult. They chatted for about half an hour and then parted as friends. Naily waved goodbye to Martha, hoping that they would meet again sometime. But they never did, for over the past month Naily's health had deteriorated considerably, and she could not find the strength for another walk, though from time to time she thought of her meeting with little Andrew, and the thought of him always brought a sweet smile to her lips. Once Naily had even tried to tell her husband about it, but he had not been understanding. Why are you listening to some quacks? You are being treated by a qualified doctor, not a village witch doctor, and all these prophecies are pure fiction and lies. You see how many of them there are lately. They're used to living at other people's expense, and they don't want to work. It's easier to fool people and get paid for it, Vincent reacted sharply. Honey, I was just saying that I didn't mean it. It wasn't anything serious. I just liked Andrew and his mom, Naily retorted, her lips pressed together resentfully. During that conversation, sensing the change in her voice, Vincent had decided not to pursue such an unpleasant topic and had turned his attention to something else. What Naily didn't know was that afterward she had been too lazy to find Martha in person to give her an opinion on her prophecies. Listen, you half-baked witch, don't interfere with my family's life. My wife and I will figure out what to do and when to do it. And you and your predictions, go fool someone else during his angry tirade on Martha's face did not shake a single muscle. She was letting Vincent know that she wasn't afraid of him and that she was ready to go all the way. I only tell people what I see and all my predictions have come true. That means I've helped others and kept them from making irreparable mistakes. Vincent relented. He gave her a hateful look and turned his back and walked away. Martha stared after him for a long time, feeling a growing uneasiness. This was usually the case when a person was in real danger and Naily had to be rescued. As they approached the McCullough house, Nick honked his horn, and after a couple of seconds, the automation kicked in. The gate slowly opened, and Vincent was already waiting for him in the yard, patting the notary's shoulder confidingly. Good to see you again, Nick the host said. Here's the thing. You know, I'd like to mention it in person while Naily can't hear. The fact is, she's seriously, very seriously ill, you know. Is it really that bad, Nick? Asked anxiously. Are the doctors doing everything they can? Yes, only the result so far is extremely disappointing. That's why I'm forced to make this difficult decision. There's no telling what might happen. After all, if Naley dies, the family business will just be bled dry, you know. I mean, it's just a matter of this and that. And the competition's still out there. They're just about to take our piece of the pie. 
the notary looked at the owner of the house with distrust. To tell the truth, Vincent McCullough was not a pleasant person to talk to. The businessman's behavior was alarming and illogical. His wife was dying and all he cared about was business. Even though all the assets belonged to Naley. After all, it was she who managed to accumulate the initial capital by working on the stock exchange. Having led it to develop his own business, according to Nick, Vincent came to everything ready to go. When Nathalie McCullough was firmly on her feet and could compete with many of the successful businessmen of the city and region, the notary was brought out of his state of anxious reflection by the ingratiating voice of the landlord. Well, I think the formalities are over. Then we can go into the house. Naley's probably waiting for us by now. Nick nodded and pulled his hand out of his coat pocket and headed inside. At that moment, he didn't even notice the note the fortune teller's son had given him fall out of his left pocket. Vincent did not yawn, however, and picked it up from the leaf-strewn pavement. He waited for the guest to enter the house, then quickly unfolded the note and ran his eyes over it. The note contained only a single phrase, take care of your wife, Vincent's face contorted into a grimace of displeasure. Is that what this is about? I don't need to take care of my wife anymore. Well, we'll see, we'll see, he muttered to himself. Folding the note, Vincent walked over to the trash can and immediately discarded it. That's a lot better than the kind of people who throw notes around and cause confusion between spouses. Seeing a pale as chalk naily, Nick involuntarily flinched. What, do I look that bad, she asked ironically. No, Naley, it's fine. It's just that you've lost so much weight noticeably. Naley sighed sadly, well, you see, that means there's more to come. Other people are on diets 24 hours a day, but I'm losing weight. Having exchanged a couple of joking remarks, Naley suggested the notary to get down to business. At that moment, Nick remembered the note the boy had handed him. Wait a minute, Naley. I have this thing that was passed to you by a kid. Funny one, he also has a mom who's a fortune teller. I think they kind of work at the park. Naley smiled understandingly. Ah, that must have been Andrew. He's a good boy. Where's that note? Nick carefully checked one pocket another, but the note was nowhere to be found. I'm sorry, Naley, I'm terribly embarrassed, but apparently I lost that piece of paper somewhere, maybe in the car or in the yard. While I was walking to the house, Nick said thoughtfully, blushing to the roots of his hair. At that moment, Vincent McCullough entered the living room, casting his guest a mocking glance he said. Weren't you the one who lost the note in the yard? It fell just above the rainwater drain grate. Nick instantly perked up and a light of hope flashed in his eyes. And what about it? I hope she survived. Vincent grinned wickedly survived. I'll bet she did. She fell right into the sewer drain. So Nick, no offense, but I'm not much of a diver. The notary exhaled disappointedly. Vincent guessed from his guest's reaction that he knew nothing of the note's contents. I wonder who handed him that piece of paper. What difference does it make? The important thing is that the evidence is destroyed. All the rest is trivial, Vincent thought as he sat down beside his wife. Saddened by the loss, Nick filled out the necessary paperwork in silence. He felt that he had failed not only the boy, but Naley herself. It was possible that the note might have contained something important, but it didn't seem to make any sense now. Throughout the whole procedure, Naley felt unwell. The persistent dizziness and nausea prevented her from concentrating on all the nuances of the notary's case. Finally, when everything was finished, she signed the necessary papers and exhaled in relief. 
There we've done it. A will at 32. Would anyone believe such a thing? Nick lowered his gaze in embarrassment. As a man of intelligence and foresight, he'd realized before he'd visited the house that Vincent had been the one who'd initiated the will. Now, in the event of Naley's death, he would receive not only her entire business, but also all the financial assets lying in some of the world's banks. But Nick didn't care much about these subtleties. The point was quite different. The notary was concerned that Naley was so irresponsible about her health. If she didn't think about herself, who would want her? The answer to that question could only be given by Naley herself. But judging by her passive mood, she was in no hurry to do so. Nick left McCullough's house and looked around the yard once more. Vincent hadn't been lying the note was nowhere to be seen. With a resigned wave of his hand, he got into the car and started the engine. Unfortunately, the pang of guilt was still there gnawing at his soul like a wild, hungry beast. I promised the boy I'd give him that note, didn't I? And the boy wouldn't have come to my house at the crack of dawn if there hadn't been something important in that message the notary pondered. Nick turned to the highway. His mood was completely ruined. He was going to visit his sick father. A nurse was a nurse, but Hector had no one closer than his son. Nick had always been proud of his dad. The bus driver had spent half his life behind the wheel and knew almost everything about engines. Nick remembered well the times when he and his father traveled around the city, sitting next to the window in the cabin of the bus. And he also liked to go with his dad and his colleagues to picnics and rather nice sit-downs by the fire with baked potatoes, fried sausages, and pickles. All this idol was cut short in an instant when Hector's bus was involved in a terrible accident, colliding with a truck that had lost control. In fact, the driver of the truck was not at fault, because the front wheel burst on the move completely deprived him of maneuverability. From the strong impact, the interior of the bus caught fire, and there was panic among the passengers. Nick did not know all this then, and read about the incident only in the newspapers. The impact was so strong that the bus driver was trapped in the cabin, and in case of fire, it reduced his chances of survival to zero. Passengers jumped out of the flaming bus and quite expectedly thought only of themselves. Nick's father was already mentally saying goodbye to his life when a miracle happened he was helped out of the burning bus. And the most amazing thing was that the rescuer of Hector was a girl. Unfortunately, at that moment he had already lost consciousness and did not have time to ask the name of the young heroine. Nick's father was lucky he survived. True, to call full-fledged this life was no longer possible. In the accident, Hector injured his spine, from which he was confined to a wheelchair for many years. Of course, Nick did everything possible for his father, but his health was deteriorating by the day. But the young notary did not lower his hands. He provided his father with proper care, hiring a nurse and paying for the services of a private doctor's house call. The longer Nick thought about Naley's will, the more he realized that something was wrong with the case. Even very wealthy people try to be treated in special institutions, but not at home as Naley did. And where does her husband look? Doesn't he see anything? Or maybe he's just pretending? Tired of puzzling over what was in the note, Nick decided to find a fortune teller and personally ask her what happened. To do so, he called the receptionist and canceled the appointment. He found Martha almost immediately. This was partly thanks to Andrew. Nick saw him right away. Oh, Uncle Lawyer is back, exclaimed the boy and began to jump on the spot. Not a lawyer, but a notary, son. Believe me, they are two completely different fields, Martha corrected her son. Hello. Did you deliver the note to Naley McCullough? 
Nick got straight to the point. Yes, that's right. I hope you delivered it to the address, she asked. Nick lowered his eyes in embarrassment. Unfortunately, I couldn't do that. Let me ask you, what was in that note? Martha suddenly turned pale. Slight wrinkles appeared in the corners of her eyes. She still wore a headscarf on her head, making her look like a villager. Naley is in danger. I wrote to her to be careful with her husband, Martha replied in a shaky voice. Nick shook his head uncomprehendingly. But how did you know about it? And why did your son come to me with the note in the first place? Martha's face seemed carved out of plaster. No one could understand what she was feeling at that moment. Finally, the fortune teller answered. I had a dream tonight. It was more like a vision. It involved you, Naley, and her husband. That's why I asked for your help. Nick looked at her doubtfully. Does she really think that he will believe in all this mystical nonsense? No, but it's ridiculous. Dreams. Omens. It's pure fraud, that's what it is. However, Nick didn't say it out loud and only asked one question. You forgive me, of course. But in general, what is the error rate of your predictions? My mom always tells the truth. She had a real gift after she was almost killed on a bus. Well, just like that superhero from the cartoon, intervened in the conversation Andrew. Andrew interjected. Nick turned pale and asked, addressing Martha rather than her young son. On the bus? A fire on a bus eight years ago? I didn't mishear that, did I? My father worked on that route. Hector, maybe you know. The fortune teller's lips treacherously quivered and tears welled up in her eyes. Yes, I know your father. Not personally, of course. I'm the one who pulled him off the bus. I saved him. I suffered severe burns to my head. The wounds healed over time, but the scars remain. That's why I wear a scarf to cover the burns. Now it was Nick's turn to be surprised. God, is it possible? I had thanked my father's savior so many times in my mind, and I had no idea that one day I would be able to thank her. Martha lowered her eyes in embarrassment. That's what anyone in my position should have done. In a way, I'm even grateful to your father and what happened. The notary looked at her in surprise, a mute question in his eyes. Martha nodded and continued. I had gone to terminate the pregnancy that day. I was a naive fool, I believe the restaurant manager's son, and I fell in love. As the epiphany came, it was like a bucket of ice water poured on my head. Four to five weeks pregnant, my fiance didn't talk much. He just handed me the money and sent me to the hospital. I was crying the whole way, stupid me. I couldn't make up my mind, but when that accident happened, I immediately realized what I had to do. I made a vow to myself if I survive, I'll keep the baby and become the best mom in the world. And if I didn't, then how could I be of any use? Martha's confession shocked Nick to the core. Looking at Andrew, who was standing nearby, Nick smiled and winked at him. The boy took the baton and responded with a thumbs-up gesture of approval. Martha gave her son an affectionate look and turned her attention back to Nick. After the incident with the bus, I started having visions. At first I thought it was the result of the trauma, but the truth was a little different. My grandmother told me that there were fortune tellers and clairvoyants in our family, but the chain of gifted people was broken. But I have a gift again. Unfortunately, I can only see the coming danger that threatens a particular person and nothing more. Nick looked at Martha with respect. 
After all, if it weren't for her, his father would have died on that bus, which had become a fire trap for him. So you think Naley is in danger? Nick broke the silence. I don't even doubt it, and I'm 200% sure of it. The notary hesitated. The fortune teller's words definitely made sense, but Naley looked calm. She'd signed the papers herself. It was hardly forced, but it wouldn't hurt to take a closer look at the McCullough house. Returning to this, Nick began to mentally go over those who could help him in this difficult task. But no matter how much he thought, he could not find a suitable candidate. At the same time, Vincent McCullough, with a sense of accomplishment, took Naley to her room and helped her to bed so that she could get some rest before the doctor arrived. When he was satisfied that his wife was asleep, he quietly closed the door and hurried to the hall where he intended to make one very important call. Deciding that Naley was already dreaming for the tenth time, Vincent turned on the video call, as he had done so many times before. He waited for quite a while. When he was desperate, a sleepy girl's voice came through. Yes, darling, hello. Did you want something? Vincent bit his lip in impatience. Of course I wanted something. Mavis, it worked. You hear that? She made a will in my favor. Who did? Your wife? Vincent cringed. Well, yes, she did. Who else? Now all we have to do is bide our time and we'll be in business. There was a touch of resentment in Mavis's voice. There we go waiting again. Our babies won't wait. I already went to the ultrasound. I didn't wait for you. You're always busy. Imagine we'll have twins. What's not to help a rich dad like you? Vincent sighed convulsively. What a stroke of luck. How could he have hoped to be the father of two beautiful babies at once? Naley was a rotten vessel with her pockets full of money and no way to get pregnant. Just be patient. Things will change soon. There'll be a holiday on our street too. You mark my word. Yes, what else? Your brother's coming. Remember today? I'll expect him at three. Make it look real. He should take his robe too because he always has stains on it. He's a doctor at a private clinic, Vincent said in a business-like tone. Okay, I'll tell him. All right, I'll see you later, Mavis whispered languidly and disconnected the call. There you go, as usual. I didn't have time to say a word to her brother, Vincent exclaimed resentfully. In the back of his mind, he saw himself as the head of the McCullough financial empire. How could he not, with Naley's time running out? The medicines he and his fake Dr. Sam had given Naley were just harmless vitamins and nothing more. It was a very different kind of illness. The plan of Vincent and his mistress was for Naley to pass away on her own, without any poisoning or other crime. The thing was, he was scared to death of going to prison, where the unwritten laws reigned. Mavis's brother, Sam, just laughed. Come on, there's nothing to be afraid of. I've done two terms, and I'm alive and well. But you're wrong to refuse the poison. I'm working at the morgue now as a corpsman. I can arrange for the body not to be cut open. I've got the connections. But Vincent didn't want to hear anything about crime. Instead, he had devised a very clever scheme whereby Naley was to escape from complications of a disease that no one was actually going to treat. Thus, Brother Meavies would come to their house from time to time, and after examining Naley, would give her a new batch of what were simply vitamins. Sam played his part skillfully, having heard all sorts of medical words and terms in the morgue. 
he used them like a sleeve. The only problem was the tattoos on the bones of his hands. Vincent had wanted to use makeup at first, but Mavis had suggested that he take the easier route and simply wear medical gloves. The theatrics worked well during the examination of the patient. For weeks now, Naley had been taking vitamins instead of expensive broad-spectrum drugs. Today, too, Vincent couldn't help but worry as he waited for Sam to arrive. His worries were unnecessary, though, because everything had gone smoothly with the notary. Of course, it wasn't easy to persuade Naley to remain calm and continue to believe in the power of the pills. It's nothing. She's been so dumb lately that she won't be able to put two plus two together, Vincent thought with a wry smirk on his lips. If only he'd known that right now, Naley was watching him, standing at the railing of the second-story staircase, staggering from side to side from exhaustion when she hadn't swallowed the sleeping pills. After witnessing Vincent's creepy confession during the video call, Naley couldn't believe herself. Could it all be a hallucination? But that's what happens when people have delusions. She was experiencing something like that right now. She was seeing things that couldn't be real. But no matter how much Naley rubbed her eyes or pinched her shoulder, it was still the same. God, what to do now? Where to run to? Who to ask for help? A phone. I need a phone. But I'd given it to Vincent so that the calls and notifications wouldn't interfere with my sleep. God, I'm such an idiot. Laylee's mind raced. But it was too late to tear her hair out. While Naley agonizingly searched for a way out of the situation, Nick decided to go back and have a thorough talk with her husband. The young notary had not thought through the strategy of the conversation and, as it often happens, hoped against hope. Many people knew that if necessary, Nick could dumb down anyone, because at the beginning of his career he worked as a criminal defense lawyer in the city court and masterfully knew how to confuse the situation. But as he pulled up to McCullough's house a second time, his attention was caught by a thin young man in his mid-thirties, short-cropped hair, a wary, scratchy gaze that smelled cold. Wait, 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 where could I have seen him before, wondered the notary. The stranger approached the massive gate of the McCullough house and pressed the bell button several times. Nick took a closer look and almost lost his senses at what he saw. Oh, it's Sam Zotov. That's right. I defended him in court a few years ago. Robbery is part of an armed group. How long ago? That was five to seven years ago. He hasn't changed much. Still the same angry look and hedgehog haircut. Nick's suspicions only grew stronger after what he'd seen. What kind of business could Vincent and Sam be in? Especially since one of them was a longtime pilot and the other a possible heir to his wife's vast financial empire. When she heard the doorbell ring, Naley flinched. Surely it must be the doctor in disguise showing up again. What's his name? Sam. Honey, get up. The doctor's here for a checkup, Vincent announced in a well-practiced voice. Naley went quietly back to her room to feign sleepiness after the unplanned awakening. I'll be right back. I'll just tug on my robe. Okay and her spouse was already meeting her accomplice in the living room. Winking at each other, the conspirators exchanged a firm handshake and walked leisurely to Naley's room. How's Mavis? Oh, it's great. Such a person. Last time she called, she was so excited. The disguised doctor looked at him sideways and hissed quietly. What do I know? Do you think she's reporting this to me? Vincent nodded in agreement and was about to open the door to his wife's room when he heard the ringing of a bell from downstairs. Sam looked at Vincent with obvious disapproval. What are you doing? Waiting. 
couldn't you have invited me some other day? I didn't invite anyone. What's the matter with you? I don't even know who it is Vincent was indignant and went to open the door. He was surprised to see the notary smiling embarrassedly at the door. Here, Nick, what have you forgotten? Or did something happen? Nick shifted his gaze to the guest in the medical coat and realized that he recognized him too. A second later, a knife glinted in Sam's hands. Of course, he recognized the former lawyer who had never been able to save him from a criminal conviction over eight years ago. Where is he, Vincent? Did he expose us? Screamed the disguised recidivist and lunged at Nick with the knife. Vincent hesitated for a moment, giving his guest precious time to make a decision. But Nick didn't make it out of the house in time. As he fell under the hail of blows, he realized that he had been foolish to go into that dangerous place alone. The forces were clearly not on the side of the notary, who was not a strong man, being thin and wiry. Perhaps, if this Dr. Bandit had not had a knife, Nick would have been able to get out of the situation unharmed. But when he felt a sharp pain in his lower abdomen, he realized that time was running out in minutes maybe even seconds. His eyes immediately darkened, and his mouth felt a nasty bitterness that made him acutely thirsty. Falling to the floor, Nick didn't know that at that very moment Naley had already gotten to the phone and was calling the nearest police station. Nor did he hear the sirens of the patrol cars that had surrounded the house in minutes, blocking all entrances and exits. The last thing that stuck in Nick's memory was the crying eyes of Naley, who had witnessed the drama that had unfolded during the arrest by the police. Vincent had tried to pass himself off as a victim, blaming Sam's accomplice, but it didn't work out so well. Handcuffed, they went to the police station, where they had a long, detailed conversation with the local operatives. The badly wounded Nick was taken away by ambulance but Naley refused to be hospitalized because the next day she was going to undergo a full examination in one of the clinics. The most affected by this situation was a young notary who happened to be in the center of events. Despite the fact that Nick's operation was carried out in time, he was still in a critical condition. All to blame was the traumatic shock he experienced during the wounding. During the interrogation, Vincent denied everything. He tried to accuse Sam of all the deadly sins, but for such a stubborn suspect, the investigator had his own tricks. One of them was a certain amount of credible information obtained during an interview with a repeat offender. Posing as a doctor. That's where Vincent got a big surprise. Mevis and Sam weren't actually related. They were secretly involved in a love affair in which they were expecting a future twin. The conspirators' calculation was simple by deceiving Vincent. The couple intended to rob the wealthy heir to the ground after he had gotten rid of his rapidly declining wife. It was a huge blow to Vincent, whose line of defense was deeply breached. Only now did he realize that all this time Mavis had been deceiving him, using him for her own ends. It happened to be the tragic outcome Martha had envisioned when she had tried to warn Naley of the danger. She didn't consider the wealthy businesswoman a friend or close acquaintance. She'd probably do it for anyone who needed help one way or another. And Nick's children died, Andrew asked sadly. Yeah, I saw the story on the news, he added quietly. Martha gathered her son's unruly hair and quietly replied, No, he's a live son, only in a coma. And when he'll come out, no one knows. I think we should go and see him. Yes, of course, we'll go by all means. When? Today, tomorrow, Andrew said animatedly. Martha shook her head, no, buddy. In a couple of days, it will be fine. Naley, remembering the bravery shown by Nick, 
took care of all the expenses related to the operation and subsequent rehabilitation. But the most important news awaited the businesswoman a little later, when she learned the results of her tests. My God, I don't have oncology. There was a mistake during the last examination. Yes, it's a miracle, Naley tearfully exclaimed. Of course, it was still too early to be truly happy because she had a long course of treatment ahead of her under the care of experienced real doctors of the highest qualification. At the same time, she never forgot what Nick had done for her. When she entered his room, she could not hold back her tears. Next to the motionless body of her son, sitting in a wheelchair, was Nick's father, Hector. The disabled man's hands were trembling with excitement. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. The former bus driver arrived at the hospital despite the prohibition of the nurse and the attending physician, which shocked the medical staff to the core. At that moment, the door of the ward creaked softly and Martha and Andrew appeared on the threshold. They had all gathered to pay their respects to the man who had risked his life to save others. I think we need to speak to him aloud, someone in the audience pronounced. There is an opinion that it is the best remedy in such cases Naley suggested quietly. In the short time she had been undergoing the treatment, her cheeks had turned pink again and a mischievous glint had appeared in her eyes. Agreed, Martha nodded, confident that Nick was hearing every word perfectly. So I can sing a song, Andrew asked with a smile. Of course you can, just quietly. Otherwise, you might wake up the whole ward. Naley smiled and winked at the baby, remembering the day they had first met. The weeks flew by. Finally, Nick came out of his coma, and his first phrase was, Where's my dad? All this time, Martha, Naley, and Hector were on alternating duty in the room, patiently waiting for him to return to the world of the living. As it happened, the moment of awakening fell precisely on Martha's shift, who greeted him with a smile on her face. She was also without her customary shawl, which skillfully concealed her burned scar. And it suits you very well. Why don't you not wear it anymore? Okay, Nick whispered with a smile and closed his eyes tiredly. Martha touched his hand gently sending a pleasant wave of shivers through his entire body. She'd been in Nick's room almost every day since then. She also took Hector with her, so that the lonely father wouldn't have to go through the separation so hard. The most happy about it was Andrew, who chatted with the former driver all day long about everything in the world funny stories from his life and retold someone else's road stories. By the time they were discharged from the hospital, Nick and Martha already considered themselves a couple and openly emphasized their status. How could it be otherwise when there was a love in their hearts that only grew stronger with each passing day? Looking at the lovers with a smile, Naley sincerely rejoiced at their happiness. However, the businesswoman's joy was not groundless at all, because during her treatment at the clinic, she managed to get acquainted with a very nice therapist raising a young daughter alone. After being discharged from the hospital, Nick returned to his old job, which he now liked even more. It is also rumored that the notary has become more careful in business and now checks the information received several times, especially when the issue concerns inheritance. Later, Martha and Naley became family friends, never ceasing to amaze others with their successes. Maylie's wedding gift to Martha was plastic surgery, which almost perfectly removed all the unpleasant memories of the fire on the bus. After dropping her son off at her mother-in-law's house, Jeanette froze when she overheard her conversation with her neighbor. And having taken a DNA test, Caleb sent Valerie an air kiss goodbye and started the car with a sense of complete satisfaction. He was very pleased, 
his lighthearted romance had grown into something more. Caleb had been thinking for almost a month now that he felt much better with Valerie than he did with his wife. If it weren't for his son, he probably would have confessed everything to Jeanette by now to set the record straight. But there was one thing that made him very uncomfortable. Jeanette and Caleb had a good life by modern standards. They both had small businesses. The man owned a car repair shop and his wife ran a dry cleaning shop. They also had a nice house and each had a car. So financially, they were both making good money and didn't have much trouble. At first, Caleb liked that Jeanette was a serious person. Even then, she was already taking her first steps in business. Her dry cleaning was a tiny place in one of the basements. But over time, the woman had grown quite well. And with the scale, as it seemed to Caleb, somewhere flew away in his wife's femininity. Three years ago, the husband could not stand it and made a very rash decision for himself. He was not embarrassed by the fact that even a brief affair constituted adultery. Well, what am I supposed to be crazy about now? Caleb said to himself at the time. I want a normal woman around me, not a robot. That's what he used to call Jeanette. Of course, his wife was not a robot, but her life was in fact subject to a certain schedule. In addition to work, she had to deal with domestic issues and her son. Daniel was in the third grade and his hobbies and interests took up a large part of his life and consequently of his mother's life. Caleb tried not to interfere. All that said, he was involved with his son from time to time, but more he was disappearing somewhere, either with friends or with his mistress. Jeanette was so absorbed in her own affairs that she didn't notice that she and her husband were less and less likely to go out or spend time together. Apart from shared holidays and birthdays and summer holidays, they had almost forgotten when they just sat and talked. Caleb himself often said he had things to do. That's not to say Jeanette ignored her husband completely, but it seemed to Caleb that he felt much better in someone else's house and bed than he did in his own. A dangerous misconception the man hadn't yet realized. Something must be done about it, he said aloud. Valerie, I will never leave. Divorce I'm not afraid of. Jeanette will take half the property. Whether she'll let me communicate with Daniel is the question. Though I don't really care about that. In recent months, Caleb had grown increasingly cold toward Daniel. He'd once thought what he'd done would be best for both of them. But now his son was beginning to annoy him. The boy wanted to talk to him now and then. And Caleb was cut off. He looked at him and understood. The phone rang and he answered it. Jeanette told him she was going to take Daniel to his mother's house. It was Saturday. Jeanette, I'll probably be late tonight, her husband replied calmly. We're in the middle of a workshop. If you need anything, call me. He glanced at the clock. It was nearly 12 o'clock. He could have stayed late at Valerie's, of course, but that provoked some pain in him. He wanted to drop everything and marry his mistress. And to do that, he had to decide to divorce his wife. On the one hand, Caleb was ready for it, but on the other hand, there was still fear in him. What will she do to me? He reasoned. If I don't love her anymore, is that a crime? Of course, in a man's eyes, it was no crime. And he was not going to plunge into philosophy, much less into religious speculation. He hadn't killed a man, so everything else was okay. Caleb decided to go to his old friend. He had lived out of town for a long time. The man remembered how everyone made fun of him at school. Edwin was going to become first a gynecologist, then an obstetrician. Everyone who was not lazy made obscene jokes in his direction. But as it turned out later, Edwin became a very good specialist, and five of his classmates gave birth with him. About a year ago, he suddenly left the practice, said he was tired. Caleb had met him about four months ago and was amazed at how much his life had changed. A, hey, Caleb, hello mate, rejoiced the host. Come in. He opened the wicket door wide open. Edwin had divorced his wife back when he was still working as an obstetrician. Or rather, she had left him when Edwin was a normal man, as Caleb called him. He made a good living and enjoyed taking gifts. He was approached by the rich for help. Edwin also helped Caleb, for which he thanked him very well. But the doctor's wife was not enough. She drove an expensive car, holidaying abroad while Edwin worked, took great risks. He did not cheat on her, although he lived a well-to-do life. But after the doctor learned that his wife had a lover, it was as if his life was cut short. 
Yeah, look at you screamed Leslie in his face. You're a loser. Anyone else in your position would be a head doctor by now and making decent money. Leslie, don't you have enough? Edwin looked at his wife in amazement. Why, you live like a queen. It's not like you don't need anything. What nonsense are you talking? She stood her ground. I want a flat in Dubai, a new car. I'm ashamed to be driving a wreck like this. Edwin had spoiled his wife so much that she had reached the point of extreme insolence. She tried to blame her adultery on her unhappy husband, who took bribes and good gifts to provide for her. But the divorce was scandalous. Leslie tried to vilify her ex-husband as best she could. Naturally, she also used in her game and daughter. She immediately declared that he would never see her. For almost a year, the doctor went crazy, and then a strange idea came into his head. I want to give it all up, he said to himself. Move into our country house. Let everyone leave me alone. So he did. The final issues with the division of property were finalized and Edwin secluded himself in the middle of nowhere. He took up yoga and spiritual development, created his own website, and gave counseling on women's health issues. He had enough to live on and he was happy about that. But it took a long time to recover from the lifestyle Edwin had previously led. A lot of that had to do with Caleb as well. And changed your life dramatically in general, Edwin wondered at his former classmate. Well, you have. I can assure you that I feel much better now, he smiled. I'm never going back to my old life. Well, what about helping children be born into the world? His guest immediately asked him. Isn't that a worthy mission? Not in this day and age, he sighed. Unfortunately, the system will break even a man with the purest of intentions. As long as everything can be bought and sold, there will be no honest doctors. We don't have free medicine. People still can't understand that. You still need to put money in someone's pocket or thank them. It would be better if the services were paid. Then it would at least be fair, Edwin said. Oh, come on, Caleb laughed. You wouldn't live on your penny salary. Besides, how many people have you helped, including me? Do you know how much I regret it now? Caleb stared intently into his eyes. What I did was a crime Caleb felt like the old Edwin was dead. A complete stranger sat before him. The man shuddered. He was uncomfortable in this company. Somehow the conversation was not flowing. And Caleb, citing that he was busy, was going home. It was good to see you. Caleb shook Edwin's hand in farewell. May everything work out for you. Thank you, the man smiled. Good luck to you too, he replied without much enthusiasm. Caleb had wanted so badly to talk to his old friend straight, to tell him about Valerie. But now he realized clearly that Edwin would be out of his life forever. Idiot, he muttered to himself under his breath, to trade such prospects to stand upside down. Yoga helped him come to his senses. He chuckled. Yeah, wait for it. You just had a phase shift. Caleb couldn't understand his friend for many reasons, and the main one was that Jeanette had never cheated on him. He couldn't even imagine the pain of that. What didn't bother the man was how she would feel after he informed her of his mistress. His mood had soured. Somewhere inside, he also felt that Edwin was right about something. They shouldn't have started this whole thing, especially now that he wanted to divorce Jeanette. The baby was only getting in his way. Jeanette came out of the dry cleaners. She worked seven days a week. The girls rotated shifts. Over the years, her small business had already developed a reputation. So Jeanette no longer had to prove anything to anyone. Now she just had to keep things running. It was much harder to keep her customers than it was to find them. Maintaining high standards wasn't for everyone. Despite the fact that Jeanette had been in the business for many years, there was always plenty of work. When the girl met Caleb, he hinted to her a couple of times that a wife should stay at home and watch over the family hearth. But Jeanette immediately made him realize that she is not going to sit on his neck. And in time, her decision proved to be the right one. Even the birth of a child did not make her give up her small business, and the work did not give her boredom. She didn't have time for silly arguments with her husband. Jeanette made sure Daniel got into the car, started it, turned around, and headed toward her mother-in-law. It had to be said that Caleb's parents kept out of their lives. They loved Daniel, so every once in a while a woman would bring them a grandson. Mum, 
Just don't stay too long, the boy asked. I don't want to sit up at their house until night. Grandfather will make me play cards again. And you know how I don't like them. All right, I promise to be quick, Mum smiled. Daniel, maybe we can go out tomorrow. It's been a while since we've gone anywhere. Dad has tomorrow off. Yes, cheered the son. He promised me he'd play with me. We need to finish our Lego city. Deal Jeanette replied and sank into herself. Her son asked her questions from time to time. The neighbors of the premises were about to move out and Jeanette was trying hard to figure out if she needed to expand her company. The dry cleaning business was certainly thriving. Many people had small washing machines in their homes, which was one of the reasons they were called upon. There were also quite a few wealthy people in town who wore quality brand name clothes. Many models could not be washed in water, dry cleaning was required. Carpets were particularly popular. It was for the latter that she wanted to expand her space a bit. We should get some Jeanette decided to herself about the neighboring shop, especially since a few people have already come to look at it. I'll drop Daniel off and call the landlord. We've been working with him for years, so he shouldn't be able to turn me down. The car stopped outside a small house and Daniel reluctantly got out. Jeanette's mother-in-law immediately appeared outside the yard. Come in, she said friendly. Let's have some tea, Mrs. Lillian suggested. You'll excuse me, but I can't right now. I'll sit at your place tonight when I come to pick up Daniel, the daughter-in-law promised. She jumped into the car and drove to work. On the way, she dialed the owner of the room she was renting. He asked her to come over in an hour. It took her until almost 12 noon to get her affairs in order. It was 5.40 and the woman decided to go straight to pick up Daniel. Arrived a little earlier than she had promised her son and mother-in-law. Walked into the house just as she expected. There was a grandfather sitting on the floor playing cards with his grandson. Good evening, she said hello. And where is Mrs. Lillian? Yes, in the vegetable garden. Perhaps she has gone to her neighbors, Jeanette. Call her home, replied the father-in-law. The guest headed for the vegetable garden. She knew that Caleb's parents had, so to speak, a secret entrance, a small gate through which one could get into the neighbor's yard. An old lady lived there, with whom her father-in-law and mother-in-law had been friends for many years. Jeanette realized that Mrs. Lillian was probably at her place. The woman was nowhere to be found in the vegetable garden. So the daughter-in-law went to the wicket. Behind it, the neighbor's shed began immediately. Jeanette heard voices. She had a few meters to go to open the wicket. Which one, Mrs. Judy? It's hard to say. We love Daniel, as if he were our own grandson, a familiar voice reached her. Jeanette froze. Her heart was pounding so hard she feared it was about to jump out. Well, where's their son? He's sick, isn't he? I don't think anyone wants him, the old woman said. Well, yes, he has cerebral palsy. Not in the most severe form, but still Mrs. Lillian replied. Everything whirled round in front of Jeanette's eyes. She crouched down on a large stone that lay right next to the wicket. Probably lives like that in an orphanage for invalids continued her mother-in-law. Sometimes my heart aches so much for him. It's a shame about the baby, of course, but Caleb didn't want him. What could we do? Judge not, lest ye be judged, whispered the neighbor. Lillian, nobody knows maybe it was all for the good. All right, Mrs. Judy, I'll go came the voice of the mother-in-law. And Jeanette jumped up from the stone like a scalded woman and ran swiftly to the exit of the vegetable garden. Mrs. Lillian, where are you shouted Mrs. Jeanette barely holding back her tears. Her mother-in-law came out of the neighbor's wicket and headed towards her with a smile. She immediately noticed Jeanette's pale face. Yes, my stomach hurts something, she lied. That's why I came early to pick up Daniel. Of course, go home, Mrs. Lillian worried. Let me pack him up. Five minutes later, Jeanette was driving her son home and crying loudly. And Daniel didn't understand what was happening to his mom. Son, it's okay she wiped her tears away with her hand. There's just one problem, but I'll be sure to solve it. Jeanette couldn't eat. Jeanette sat and looked at Daniel. No doubt she loved him. He was her baby. 
but what she had heard today was fundamentally life-changing. I can't do that, Jeanette whispered. We need to talk to Caleb. He's our son. And I'm also very curious about where Daniel came from, she thought. But that evening her husband arrived late, as luck would have it. Jeanette took a sedative and went to bed. She didn't even hear her husband come home. The next day was the hardest day of her life. Everyone was home, and Jeanette realized she couldn't keep quiet. She approached Caleb and asked him to come into the kitchen. I know everything she said quietly and cried. Her husband stood in utter amazement. Caleb couldn't understand who had told Jeanette about Valerie. The man stood silent. He was thinking about how to start off right now. You don't want to tell me everything yourself stared intently into his wife's eyes. I am miffed, husband, but there was nowhere to go. Jeanette, I've wanted to tell you this for a long time. Yes, I have another, he blurted out quickly. Jeanette stared at him in horror. For the first few seconds, she thought she was watching some kind of film. You have a mistress, she barely uttered. Caleb, her voice shook. But we have a family, Jeanette questioned. Jeanette, we're adults, he replied coldly. Yes, there was a time I loved you, but then I met Valerie. And our son, the woman, tried to piece things together. Him and her son. Everything jumbled in Jeanette's mind. What does this have to do with Daniel, he exclaimed. Jeanette, let's not make a big deal out of this. I'm filing for divorce. We'll divide everything fairly. I have no claim on you whatsoever. Caleb, are you kidding? After all, this is all a prank. No, he replied angrily. Jeanette, I don't want to live with you mercilessly. Her husband plunged the knife into her heart. Everything swirled before the woman's eyes, and she fainted from overexertion. Oh shit, Caleb swore and rushed to her, started slapping his wife's cheeks. Caleb lifted her in his arms, laid her on the couch. Jeanette opened her eyes, everything in front of her spinning. Caleb brought her some cold water and some sedative drops. Daniel was scared too. He looked at his mother with mad eyes and cried. Jeanette tried to get up but couldn't. It took her an hour to regain full consciousness. Daniel was sleeping next to her. Caleb wasn't home. God, I can't understand anything Jeanette thought as she opened her eyes. This time she managed to get up, put the kettle on. Didn't want to wake her son. Apparently the boy had been under a lot of stress. His body had exhausted itself and he was fast asleep. So I've got two problems now. The first is Caleb's infidelity and divorce. And the second is Daniel. Or rather, my real son, she couldn't calm down. Her husband returned late. Jeanette didn't call him and throw a tantrum. She had already accepted the idea that Caleb had cheated on her. Now she was more concerned about her sick son and what had happened to him. Jeanette prepared herself for another difficult conversation. It was almost 10 when the door opened. I'm getting my things, her husband said immediately. Jeanette, I don't want to muse on all this. What happened is what happened. We're adults, and we should understand everything. Caleb, let your adultery remain on your conscience, she replied calmly. That's not what I'm interested in. What does this Valerie have to do with our child? Nothing, he answered quickly, and the things are in the bag. Valerie and I have no children. Then tell me where our baby is, Jeanette grabbed his arm. I know all about it. I heard about it from your mother. Daniel is not our son, she finally uttered the hardest part. You mean you meant it when you said it, Caleb turned pale. And now it all falls into place. But so be it. I'm still glad you found out about Valerie and me. I'm not interested in your Valerie, or you replied his wife, barely containing herself. Caleb, I demand that you tell me where my son is. How do I know he wiped the sweat from his face? Stayed at the hospital. What do you want me to say? That you had serious problems during labor, and that the boy was born sick. That I was trying to protect you then so you wouldn't suffer for the rest of your life, Caleb asked. Where is my baby, Jeanette screamed. How dare you decide for me? I hate you. Do you hear me? I hate you for this. Never will I forgive you. I'm telling you again, I don't know where that kid is, Caleb raged. 
that's it. Leave me alone. You want, you can sue me for loving you and wanting you to be a happy mother. Whereas my son Jeanette covered her face with her hands and cried. Give him to me for part of him, her husband tried to speak to her more calmly. He had no hope he is an invalid for life. The woman answered him nothing. She left for the kitchen, closing the door behind her. The husband left without saying goodbye. I will definitely find him, she promised someone. I'll take my child, I'll treat him almost all night, Jeanette did not sleep. And towards morning her body couldn't take it and she fell into a deep sleep. She woke up to Daniel waking her up. Mum, am I not going to school today, he asked when she opened her eyes. Son, what time is it, Jeanette grumbled and glanced at the clock, 7.40. Let's get ready quickly. Come on, let's get dressed. I'll make breakfast. Daniel was a little late that day, but he wasn't worried about that. The important thing was that his mum was just as she had been before. No more crying, though the dark circles under her eyes said she wasn't feeling well. Jeanette walked her son to the gate, got in the car, put her head on the steering wheel and cried. I'll stop by the dry cleaners, then I'll go home. I need a couple of hours sleep so I can do some searching she made a plan for herself. The car started slowly. Jeanette's mind was reeling with the words of her husband. She realized that if it hadn't been for their real son, she would have had a very difficult divorce, and she didn't know if she would have survived it at all. Caleb had always seemed to her not only a husband, but a friend she could trust. But now he had lied to her, and at least twice. And they weren't simple matters, they were situations that directly applied to Jeanette. God, but if Caleb has proven to be so unreliable, then what about other men she uttered aloud? What was he lacking? Love and care. After all, that's what they usually say. Somehow homebodies who are willing to sit with their husbands any spare minute. Cheating doesn't go around either. Then it's all a lie. If he had honestly told me he was fed up with me, it would have been much more honest Jeanette thought as she drove up to work, but decided to sit in the car for a few more minutes. He's met his woman, she laughed. What am I then? Not his, am I? Wasn't that what he was saying to me? So men can have many women of their own. She got out of the car. Complete nonsense. Lust is the real reason. When a man is doing well and has no problems, that's when he shows his true colors. Caleb's just a womanizer. Behind the thick layer of noble man's makeup he threw in my eyes, he always hid an inability to control his flesh. Hike, cool man Jeanette thought. She had made up her mind that she wasn't going to work things out with her husband, nor complain to anyone about him cheating on her. She had Daniel, who she wanted to live for. And now that she found out about her real boy, she had even more strength. It didn't bother Jeanette at all that he was sick. She woke up to her alarm clock ringing. It was almost 11. The woman felt rested. Daniel was staying after school at an after-school care center, so she could mind her own business. The first thing Jeanette did was go to the maternity ward. She knew that the obstetrician who delivered her baby was a classmate of Caleb's. Basically, he'd introduced them. One day, her husband mentioned that he was no longer in practice. Jeanette didn't call Caleb to ask him about it. At the maternity hospital, she was told that Edwin was no longer working. When asked how she could find him, the nurse shrugged and said he lived somewhere out of town. Okay, Jeanette whispered. Thanks for your help. She smiled at the girl and quickly ran downstairs. She decided to act differently. The first few years together, they had a good relationship with another of Caleb's classmates. She was a police officer, so her husband valued the acquaintance. Jeanette had come to New York to study. She came from a small town near Florida, so she had no acquaintances here except a few classmates from the Institute. Jeanette walked into the police station and quickly found Nicole. She was busy, so she had to wait a while. Nicole, High said an old acquaintance. How are you, she smiled affably. The women got to talking. Jeanette hadn't told Nicole that she and Caleb were facing a divorce. Yeah, he's still working at his auto repair shop the same way the guest smiled. So it's business as usual for us. What do you need Edwin for? Oh, and Caleb probably knows where he lives, Nicole wondered. You understand, I'm having female problems. I don't want my husband to find out. I want to consult Edwin. It's a shame he left the maternity ward. He's a doctor from God. 
I understand, she sighed. I've been having trouble getting pregnant with my second since Nora. There's so much stress at work. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it, she waved her hand. Nicole told Jeanette how to get to Edwin's house. The woman fluttered like a butterfly. Her obstetrician doctor was the master key that would open the door to her son. But as soon as Jeanette pulled up in front of the doctor's house, she was struck with an intense fear. She began to fear that she would fail. What will I do then? What will Daniel say was the first time such a thought had entered her head? How will I explain to him the arrival of a disabled boy, and how will he feel about it? Her mother's heart clenched. Jeanette had so many questions that she didn't know the answers to. I can handle it, she said loudly to herself. That's what a woman always did in difficult situations, though. Gaining a full chest of air, she pressed the bell. To distract herself, she looked at the small house and manicured yard. Not long after, but a familiar face appeared on the street. Edwin looked at Jeanette in some amazement. He recognized her immediately. Jeanette smiled. He said hello and waited to see what his guest would say to him. Edwin, we need to have a serious talk, she said. The man's face changed immediately. It seemed to him that he had guessed the topic of conversation. Come in, he offered, closed the wicket, and escorted his guest into the house. Jeanette felt at once how easy it was to breathe a pleasant scent hit her nose. The furnishings were simple, but the many plants made it cozy. Edwin quickly brought two glasses of cold water from the kitchen. Jeanette saw that lemon and mint were visible at the bottom. Delicious, she pronounced, taking a couple of sips. Edwin, I want to say at once that I don't blame you for anything she fell silent. The master, too, was silent. It was very important to him that the woman finally spoke up. I don't even know where to begin tears ran down Jeanette's cheeks. I found out yesterday that Daniel is not our son. Edwin stood up. He was looking out the window. I've wanted to be free of this burden for so long. I don't know why I went for it, he pronounced. Perhaps I was afraid I would be accused of medical malpractice and hang the case on me. Edwin, I don't blame you for anything. You may have had your motive, she tried to speak calmly. Besides, you paid me very well. You didn't know that then he sighed. Money mattered a lot to me, then Jeanette finished the rest of her drink. The mint and lemon seemed to ease her nerves. At least she felt calmer. Edwin came back to her, sat down in the chair opposite, hesitated a moment, and continued his story. Apparently the boy had some musculoskeletal problems. He looked at Jeanette. Not everything can be determined through ultrasound. I see it this way. The labor aggravated the condition and the nerves of the muscles causing permanent damage to the bones. Could he have been helped looked up a former doctor to the guest? I don't know, he admitted frankly, before he was taken to a home for disabled children. An examination showed that he needed very expensive treatment. Naturally, the state wasn't going to bother with him. Edwin, the baby was sick in the womb. It was not my fault, but it would have been very difficult to prove. There are real cases where a child gets cerebral palsy due to a doctor's fault. But I did the right thing this time Edwin generally lowered his head, as he always did. Jeanette covered her face with her hands and cried. She realized that if she had been told then that her son was an invalid, it would have been very hard for her to bear. Now she was ready. But in those days Jeanette was not yet distinguished for her wisdom or fortitude. Where did Daniel come from she finally calmed down? He has parents Jeanette held her breath. No, his mother died in childbirth. You and she gave birth on the same day, he replied. A disadvantaged woman was brought to us. She had nothing. The labor was very difficult. The baby was born healthy, and she died the next day. I see Jeanette said detachedly. Edwin, where they took him, you know that, don't you? Yes. They've put him in a residential home for the disabled. Jerome is his maternal name. Jeanette could not help herself again, son. God, I wish he were alive. Perhaps someone adopted him. Not likely the landlord objected at once. Healthy children are not wanted. And here, do you think people dream of fiddling with the sick? Edwin felt a sense of relief in his soul. 
It had been so many years since he'd been able to shed that weight. Why did Caleb go for it, the visitor said aloud. After all, whatever he is, he is his father. Jeanette. It's not that simple, the man stepped up to her. Perhaps he was thinking of you at the time. I'm sorry, but why didn't he tell you that? I've had that question running around in my head this whole time because she wanted to answer quickly but stopped herself because he's Edwin. We're filing for divorce. Caleb has a mistress. He's gone to her. Edwin looked at her in bewilderment. When a former friend had visited him the other day, he hadn't said anything to him about it. I'm sorry, he said with concern. Jeanette, how are you going to pull two kids by yourself? It's okay, I'll manage. I'll take my son, the woman said firmly. Edwin, I'm not leaving him in an orphanage. I'm going to do everything I can to fix him. She left, and Edwin sank into himself. In fact, he was glad that all this had finally come to light. He closed his eyes and remembered those last days when he was still working at the hospital. But you know I'll pay you well, the mayor's aide glared at the obstetrician. You just tell her the baby was stillborn. Of course, powerful people often went to him. Edwin had a good reputation as a professional doctor. But after he was good at delivering their wives or mistresses' babies, getting handsome fees for it, the requests became more and more monstrous. Years after Edwin had switched Caleb's son with the son of homeless men, he was approached by the deputy mayor. Belinsky had changed his mind and decided to get rid of his mistress's child. Either that or she was up to something behind his back and wanted to claw back some of his property. In general, the man came to the doctor and began to beg him, and then blackmail him. Well, is your work not good enough, he threw angrily when Edwin disagreed. You know it's enough for me to snap my finger. Click Edwin told him, and that same day he wrote his resignation letter. It was incredible news. No one had ever expected Edwin to quit. In fact, he was ready for it. After his divorce, he wasn't in the best shape to deliver babies and operate. He sighed. Would he want to go back into practice again at first? Very much. Now he doesn't. He was drawn in other directions. Despite his many years in formal medicine, Edwin became increasingly interested in alternative methods. And he was pleasantly surprised by the results. The doctor completed several courses of aromatherapy, was fond of healing therapy, medicinal plants. You need official medicine for emergencies, he thought. But when it comes to chronic illnesses, it is vastly inferior to unconventional methods. Yoga and essential oils helped Edwin get rid of the runny nose he was suffering from. He also got rid of his high blood pressure, which was a result of his body's unaccustomed work schedule. All in all, in every way the man liked his current life. Not to say that he had a lot of clients, but those who wanted to return health, especially when they were abandoned by official medicine, were becoming more and more. Were Edwin's patients successful? Definitely yes. The man made an individual program for each case. And since he was approached by women with many different diseases, his experience was expanding, you could say, every day. Endometriosis, myomas, and other incurable diseases in official medicine were giving up their positions. There were already two cases of complete cure. However, 80% of his clients noticed an improvement. Edwin felt responsible for Jeanette and Caleb's baby. I realized I should have got Jeanette's phone number. I'll look for that boy with her, the thought occurred to him. At first Edwin wanted to call his former friend, but since the situation was very complicated, he didn't risk it. I'll go and see her myself tomorrow, he decided. We'll go to the orphanage together. Jeanette drove home in utter exhaustion. She felt like a squeezed lemon. During that half-hour conversation with Edwin, it was as if the woman had lost all her strength. I don't care what Caleb thinks there, especially since we are no longer husband and wife, she said. I'll take my baby that night Jeanette realized it wasn't that simple. She picked up her son from after-school care. Daniel was cranky, wanting to see his daddy. Son. He's away on a business trip his mother didn't know what to tell him. Then have him call me, the child pleaded. I miss him already. We never went anywhere yesterday. Jeanette couldn't figure out how she was going to cope with something that wasn't up to her. Only now did she realize that Daniel was under attack. What also confused her about the whole situation was that Caleb hadn't talked to her about Daniel. I'll find Jerome first, 
Then I'll explain everything to Daniel she tried to find a way out. And what am I going to tell him? That dad won't be living with us anymore. That he has another family now she couldn't sleep for a long time. The mess in her head kept her awake. She went back and forth from one thought to another. But they were cut off in an instant, and it was as if she were falling back into the void. In this delirium Jeanette lay almost until morning. She did not realize that she had finally fallen asleep. Caleb, but if he's not your son, then what's the problem Edwina stroked her lover's hair gently. She won't be able to file for child support. Take a DNA test he sighed. I don't even know. I thought of Daniel as my son for so many years. Sure, inside I knew he wasn't my own, but I grew attached to him. But why would you think about him when you're about to have a daughter? And believe me, she really is your girl. Perfectly healthy, the girl stroked her belly Valerie. Yes, I don't doubt you, he kissed his mistress. There will be no alimony for nothing. Do you hear me, she said more sternly. I don't want our money going to a stranger's child. Caleb didn't sleep, he kept thinking about what Valerie had told him. He hadn't felt much love for Daniel lately, but showing the DNA results in court and saying he wouldn't pay child support on him, even in Caleb's mind, would have been mean. But Valerie wasn't about to back down, she didn't want any competition. When she found out that Daniel wasn't Caleb's son, she knew immediately that she had him in her pocket now. She'd done everything she could to make him completely cold to his wife, and now she was trying to wrestle him away from his non-native son as well. What am I going to tell her? I'm sorry, but this isn't our child, he thought. After all, Jeanette doesn't even know the children were switched, because I did it. With Edwin's help, of course. But it was my initiative. In short, Caleb had backed himself into a corner. To tell Jeanette that Daniel wasn't his son, and he wasn't going to pay child support, would have looked very cynical and inhuman. Valerie could see her lover's doubts. It seemed to her that a little more pushing was needed. Caleb, I suggest you don't drag this conversation out too long, she pressed against him. Talk to her, tell her we're about to have a daughter. After all, she's a mother too and should understand me. I can't do that to her, the man resisted. It's not like I'm a pig, he threw angrily. Caleb, do you want me to leave, she sobbed. I don't want her baby, can you understand that? I want my family to be happy, Valerie defiantly clutched her stomach. Caleb startled, ran up to her, Valerie. What's wrong with you? There's going to be a miscarriage. I promise you'll talk to her, Valerie demanded. But okay, he said. Please just calm down. Breathe like this, Valerie. I love you. Can't you see that? Caleb, did I look forward to our child so much if I didn't love you, she said through her tears. Why did I take such a risk then and go out with a married man? As much as Caleb felt that he shouldn't behave like this, he still obeyed Valerie's wishes. He decided to have a serious talk with Jeanette. Jeanette dropped her son off at school and went straight to the orphanage. At the mere sight of him, everything turned over in her mind. God, she could barely hold herself together. Give me strength, the woman went straight to the director. You haven't even seen him, she threw angrily. This is how they remember their sick children years later and think they can take them away easily. No, I don't think it would be easy, replied the visitor. But that I'll take him away, that's for sure she kept her eyes on the woman. He's a recumbent. Can you understand that? I didn't want to agree to see the headmistress. You smile at him now, and then you'll be out of his life forever. And he will suffer. I want to see my child, and I demand that you allow me to take a DNA test, Jeanette said coldly. Wow, demand she does, the woman laughed. I'm the mistress here, it's up to me. When you gave your son to the orphanage, you demanded it too, didn't you? No, Jeanette replied. She realized she couldn't tell the whole story. If you don't show me my child, I will demand visitation through the courts. Okay, said the principal fearfully. You'll have five minutes. I think that will be enough time for you to decide that you will not come here again. I'll never decide for myself, the visitor threw angrily and followed the woman. Jeanette realized that this meeting would be hard on her. She had long ago drawn in her mind the boy lying on the bed. His arms were shriveled, his mouth wouldn't close so it was constantly leaking saliva. His eyes were always staring at the ceiling and there was no clarity in them. 
The headmistress stopped at some door, cast an angry glance at her guest and opened it. Entered first. After a few minutes, she asked Jeanette to come in as well. Jeanette entered the room on trembling legs. There were four children in the room. On one bed near the window was a blonde-haired boy the guest knew immediately that it was him, although there were three other children present. Jerome was looking out the window. His body did not move. He could only turn his head and work his hands a little. He turned round and cast a glance at the stranger. She was staring at him intently. I can hand out the guests to the children she addressed the principal. The latter nodded grudgingly. Jeanette gave small bags of goodies. Two of the children had typical signs of cerebral palsy. They made strange noises. Another boy couldn't even turn his head. Jerome, these are for you, Jeanette walked over to the bed. Sorry, I didn't know what you liked out of sweets. The boy looked at her intently. Jeanette could barely hold herself together. His gaze seemed to reach to the very depths of her heart. Thank you, he said quietly. I don't care. Only now did Jeanette notice how much he looked like her father. His eyes, his hair, his smile gave him away as Caleb Jr. Her guest helped him unwrap his candy, peel an orange, before she even realized that her meeting with her son had taken place. Time. Gotta go, the principal's order was heard. She walked up to her guest and fixed her with her small, unkind eyes. Before leaving, Jeanette turned around once more. There was no longer any doubt in her mind that she would come back here again. I will take him. Please provide me with a list of the paperwork that needs to be gathered for the adoption, she said confidently to the director. Edwin stopped outside the house, walked quickly to the wicket, pressed the bell, but no one opened it for him. Half past nine, I suppose. She's already gone the visitor's side. He had been slow to arrive early, and now he realized he was late. Okay, I'll be there by eight, the guest side. I'll get in the car and we'll discuss it with her on the spot. In the meantime, Jeanette was on her way home. She was madly happy. Of course, Jerome had a very serious illness, but he could talk normally. And as the mother realized, the child was a good thinker, so she was hopeful that something could be done for him. Suddenly, Jeanette thought of Daniel. She was floundering and didn't know how to tell him about his father. I'll ask Caleb to see him once in a while, she thought. Also, even though he may not want Jerome, I still have to tell him about him. Jeanette grabbed the phone and called her ex-husband. He didn't answer for a long time. Yes, came his disgruntled voice. Jeanette, I'm busy right now. What did you want, Caleb asked. We need to talk. It's an emergency. Can you meet me in a couple of hours? Can you, she asked. Okay, he replied without much enthusiasm. On the one hand, this was an opportunity for him to talk to her. On the other, the man really didn't want to tell her everything. Avoiding Daniel's alimony payments was the ultimate piggishness in his case. But for Valerie's sake, he'd have to do it. When Caleb saw no other option for him, Jeanette stopped by work. An hour to take care of business, she needed something to distract herself. The events of the last few days had been so emotional, the woman could barely stand it all. She took a few sips of hot tea, warmth spilling all over her body, closed her eyes, Jerome's face was in front of her. Her heart clenched tighter. It's going to be okay, son, she whispered. A few tears fell into her mug. I'm going to make it through this. I'll do everything I can to help. Jeanette sighed dreamily, glancing at her watch. She didn't want to be late for her meeting with her husband. They agreed to meet at a cafe. Jeanette had traveled to this meeting with great hope. Naturally, she wasn't thinking about getting Caleb back. In fact, the woman could hardly forgive his infidelity. She wanted her children to have a father. It didn't matter how his and her lives turned out in the future. The children should be able to see their father. Jeanette arrived at the cafe before the appointed time, sitting in the car with her eyes closed. She was very sleepy. The woman planned to spend no more than an hour talking to Caleb, and then she needed to pick up Daniel. She opened her eyes and noticed her ex-husband's car pull up. Startled, she looked in the mirror, lightly fixed her hand and hair, and walked into the cafe. Caleb was already sitting at the table, tapping his fingers nervously. Hi, she smiled. Jeanette, I'm not going to lecture you on how to live your life. 
You said yourself we're adults, didn't you? Jeanette, can we make this quick? I'm in a hurry, he said nervously, trying to think of an excuse. I'm sorry, but I understand. Caleb, I'll be honest if I tell you everything the woman sighed deeply. I found our son. His name is Jerome, and he looks a lot like you. The man froze nervously in his chair. He was starting to get pissed off by all these surprises with children. Jeanette, I don't want to hear anything about him, he said coldly. The smile disappeared from his ex-wife's face. Caleb, but he's your son, isn't he? He needs you, Jeanette said. Daniel asks about you all the time, too. Why should children have to suffer through their parents' choices? Daniel is not my son, he squeezed out through gritted teeth. And you know about that, Jeanette? I have a different family. Caleb, wait her heart, rolled frantically. Are you saying you won't go out with our son? No, he replied succinctly. Please don't bother me anymore. I'll be doing a DNA test. My wife is pregnant. It's not like I can go broke. We don't need your alimony, Caleb's ex-wife tried to reason with him. Daniel loves you. He'll suffer tears streamed down her cheeks. I told you he's not my son, the man jumped up and headed for the exit. This was definitely not something Jeanette had expected from her ex-husband. She couldn't even figure out what to call it. Is he completely out of his mind, the woman whispered. How can you play with people like that? He's a child, after all. All the way back, Jeanette tried to understand the motivation behind her husband's behavior, but she could think of nothing but madness. I mean, he knows he's going to hurt Daniel badly, she reasoned. After all, he's not a fool. How could he do such a thing deliberately? Ideas began to pop into Jeanette's head about Valerie being Caleb's mistress. An inadequate person, she thought. It certainly didn't excuse her ex-husband, but dancing to the tune of such an idiot was too much. Something tells me this fool will use the same methods against him, Jeanette sighed. Caleb, you're a complete moron. You have two sons and you could keep in touch with them for the rest of your life and rely on their help. But you've destroyed your own future with your own hands. All for what? For some crazy mistress. She ached at the mere thought of how she would inform Daniel that his father didn't want to know him. She was also afraid the boy would find out he wasn't their kin. Poor son, she cried again. How can I protect you from all this? Jeanette decided to take a few days to think about the best way to tell Daniel about their divorce. Plus, she needed to let him know he had a brother. Some kind of horror, the woman whispered. It's like I've been sucked into some kind of vortex and I can't get out of it. And the best part is that it's not my fault. Behind my back, Caleb was making the life he thought was best for him. He didn't care about her. Daniel, according to his mother, knew that Caleb was on a business trip. Secretly from his mother, he had called him several times today. But at first his father hadn't picked up, and then his son realized his number was blocked. Mum, will Dad be back soon, he said. I miss him so much, and Daniel cried. Son, Mum said tiredly. The day will come, and we'll talk about it. Let's not now. At home they had dinner. Neither of them was in the mood. It seemed to Jeanette that just when she had solved one problem, Another immediately appeared. She tried to distract herself. While Daniel was playing, and then suddenly the bell rang. Jeanette stepped outside. Edwin. Hi, she tried to smile. Didn't expect to see you. Jeanette. Let's talk, he said quietly. I came to see you this morning. I wanted us to go together to look for Jerome. I've already found him, she replied immediately. Edwin, I'll be doing the paperwork on him. After the divorce, I'll pick him up. And how is he, the former doctor asked with interest. Is he walking? He looked intently into the woman's eyes. No, Jeanette shook her head negatively, but he talks and moves his arms. Jeanette, I want to help you. Edwin lowered his head. After all, I am the one to blame for this whole affair. Edwin, I don't blame you for anything, she reassured him. Let's go inside and talk, Jeanette finally suggested. They sat in the kitchen. Edwin put forward his hypotheses, but without examining the boy, he could say nothing for certain. 
The principal described his diagnosis to me in general terms Jeanette told him. She was so angry with me that she wouldn't let me see his papers. Right away she started accusing me of taking him away and then bringing him back to them in a month. That's not going to happen. Is that what you told Caleb he looked at her intently? I suppose he, as a father, should know about it. Edwin, Caleb turned out to be. I'm sorry, but I don't have any words. Not only does he not want to meet Jerome, he's even disowned Daniel. I don't know what's going on with him. He told me today that Daniel is not his son and he won't pay child support for him. After all these years of dealing with him, plus he was the one who initiated the child swapping the guest's side. I'm afraid Caleb doesn't realize what he's doing. Frankly, I don't care. The most important thing to me is that my children are healthy and happy, Jeanette replied. Edwin agreed with her that next time he would go to the orphanage with her together. He wanted to see the boy. The director was even more unhappy than the first time. She kept saying something to the guests. You're wasting my time. And forcing the child to get used to you, she wasn't shy in her expressions. I am a Dr. Edwin said coldly, staring intently into her eyes. You're overstepping your authority, and I know where it needs to be reported. She quieted a little, taking her guests to Jerome. The boy was asleep. They had to wait about half an hour. I wish I could at least take him today. Jeanette couldn't stand this pressure and cried. Edwin, do you know how much it hurts? The man walked over and put his arms around her. He really wanted Jeanette to finally be together with her child. He looked intently at Jerome, checked his body first, then touched him. To some points, the boy was unresponsive. Edwin stood and pondered. One of his hands touched the area at the back of his head. Edwin touched one unremarkable point, then pressed it with force, and one of the boy's hands twitched involuntarily. Then the former doctor began to work the entire spine. Two more points were partially blocked. Edwin saw clearly as he pressed one of them with such force that one toe on the boy's foot trembled slightly. Got it, he said cheerfully. Jerome, did you feel anything? The boy shook his head negatively, but it was enough for Edwin to see with his own eyes. Jeanette, some chance we have, he smiled as they drove back home. I don't know where this might lead, but I see it that way a few courses. The treatment will probably drag on for a few years. I mean formal treatment. You need good medication and an individual program. I'm putting it together, need to work out the exercises, then incorporate the right points. I'll use everything, maybe we'll get lucky. Thank you, Edwin. I don't know what I'd do without you, Jeanette sighed. Wouldn't lose your son, he replied sadly. Jeanette, let me finalize this matter. The divorce went through. The former spouses settled their case without argument. Jeanette was fully immersed in the matter with Jerome. Mum Daniel came up to her one day. I saw him today. He was standing outside the school. Idiot Jeanette scolded to herself. Why pick on a child like that? Daniel's son, I have something important to tell you. Her voice trembled. You see, it just so happens that Daddy met another woman. He has another family now. What about me, cried the boy. Doesn't he love me anymore? He rushed tearfully to Jeanette. He loves you, of course, but the woman was just going mad. She didn't understand how to explain all this to the child. But he's very busy right now. He, his new wife, is about to have a baby girl. I'm having a sister, the boy's face brightened. Mum, will you take me to them? I'll play with her. Daniel cried. So did his mother. Son, it's not that simple. Forgive me, but you have a brother. Only he's sick. A brother, the boy couldn't understand what was going on, and a sister and a brother. Mum, is it true, son? Dad married an aunt who was expecting a child from another man. A thought came into her head. That's why you won't have a sister. You do have a brother, on the other hand. Why didn't you tell me anything about that? He asked her unhappily. I want to see him. Daniel, I didn't know about it myself, you know. The hospital didn't tell me that one son of mine was very sick and might not survive. They took Jerome away from me, and I found him only recently. His name is Jerome. Joy shone in the boy's eyes. Mum, I'm going to play with him. Son, 
He's sick. He can't walk, she finally told him. The son hesitated for a while. Nothing, he shouted. We'll put a box on the bed and collect the toys. Running, he went to his room to get the box. Jeanette covered her face with her hands and cried. A heavy weight fell from her shoulders. She realized that Daniel would miss his father very much, but she had hoped that he would befriend her boy. Promise you'll take me to him right away, Daniel demanded. I'll take him my toys. I promise kissed his mother. Will you be a good brother? I'm sure of it. Daniel didn't doubt her words. For three days he had been preparing for the meeting. There was already a bag standing in the corridor. Daniel, what is it his mother asked in surprise before leaving the house? Presents for my brother, he replied proudly. I want to give Jerome his most favorite toys. Daniel's son, let's take them piece by piece. It's just that we might get scolded at the orphanage for bringing him so many at once. Okay, my son agreed and started pulling toys out of the bag to do an audit. Finally, he picked out a car, an aeroplane, a Lego house, and a board game. Daniel's mouth stayed open the whole way. He talked excitedly about how they would play with his brother, swim in the pool in the summer, watch cartoons. Jeanette smiled the whole way. She hadn't felt so happy in a long time. Jerome already knew that the woman who visited him all the time wanted to adopt him. She also told him that she had a son. The boy was very worried. He had always dreamed of having a family for as long as he could remember. And now that it had come true, he was very afraid. Rumor had it that even if people like him were taken in, they were soon brought back. Hey, brother Daniel flew into the room. Jerome, look what I brought you and he started pulling toys out of the bag. Jerome stared at the stranger in bewilderment. His heart nearly jumped out. Here it is, the race car. But Mom said you can't have the remote here and Daniel's mouth didn't close. I know what's on it, no matter how much you squeeze the throttle. We have good tarmac in our yard, so we'll race together. After a few minutes, Jerome joined the conversation as well. His mother looked at them and cried with joy. God, thank you, she whispered. Now my boys will grow up together. They will be true friends. Finally, the day came when Jerome was taken home. At first, everything was unfamiliar to him. Right away, Edwin was involved with Jeanette. He had already made an appointment with a good doctor. He examined the boy and prescribed treatment. Two days later, Jerome was already receiving drips at home. A week later, Edwin himself became involved. Daniel never took a step away from his brother. They did everything together. It was only during school that each of them studied separately. Daniel, as he was supposed to be, in class. Jerome had a teacher who came to his house. Daniel, it's so easy his brother smiled when he complained that he couldn't do his homework. Bring it over here. I'll explain it to you. Half an hour later, Daniel had finished his maths at his brother's dictation. Don't tell mum, of course he asked. She'll scold me. You have my word, Jerome promised. You can count on me, he added maturely. Eight months passed. Daniel came running to his mother. His eyes nearly popped out of his orbits. Mum Jerome couldn't get his words out. He grabbed her hand and ran into the nursery. Jeanette saw Jerome sitting up in bed. She shrieked in surprise. Mom, I can sit up, rejoiced her son. I can feel my back. I touched it with my hands. Jeanette immediately called Edwin. He examined the boy. It was a success, both conventional and unconventional medicine. Well, Jerome, you've done well. He laughed nervously. Even the former doctor did not expect such a thing. Such a thing should be celebrated, a carriage for us. He shouted at the top of his voice. Edwin went to a special shop and brought a wheelchair. Now Jerome could move around the house on his own. Hooray. Daniel ran around his brother. We did it. He tossed his hat in the air with joy. The treatment continued, and exactly two years after it began, Jerome was finally on his feet. Jeanette cried tears of joy. Daniel squealed with happiness. Edwin sat in a chair with his hands over his face. He was crying too. How much labor had been put in, God only knew. 
and not for a moment did either of them doubt that Jerome would get up. Of course, the boy was not completely cured. He had a limp, so he walked with a crutch all the time. But that didn't matter so much anymore. Let's go to the cafe Daniel suggested. Mum, Uncle Edwin. Jerome and I love him so much. Let them see that my brother has started to walk. Of course, the boy couldn't carry such a heavy load yet, so the adults brought the wheelchair with them too. Jeanette sat looking at her children, then shifted her gaze to Edwin. How far had they traveled together? Thorny had been their journey. Their eyes met, the man staring at her intently. In those eyes, Jeanette read everything she had long known his devotion, his love, his concern for her and her children. They returned home, the children went to bed in their room, and Jeanette and Edwin sat in the living room. Both were silent. I'm very happy for you, Jeanette, the guest broke the silence. He swallowed the lump in his throat. I don't want to lie. In these two years and more, you've become my family. I love you and the children. Edwin, we love you too, she smiled. I never thought I'd say this after Caleb left, but I love you too. You're calm and easy, even in the stormiest ocean. I don't know how to explain it. I've never met anyone like you. Jeanette, maybe the only thing that makes me different is that I'm willing to change, he said calmly. Otherwise, there's nothing special about me. A lot of people do spiritual practices and yoga. But for me, it's not a tool to prove my exceptionalism. I do it because I enjoy it. Caleb sat in the car. His mood was at zero. Valerie's situation was getting worse and worse every day. He had hoped she would be better after the baby was born. But on the contrary, her character had deteriorated many times over. His wife was always dissatisfied with something, then his workshop brought a small income. Then she threw jealous tantrums and accused him that he has some other. Caleb's parents didn't approve of his choice especially after he told them that he wouldn't be hanging out with Daniel anymore. You're a fool. Caleb, his father, spat in his face. You've lost such a woman because of that woman, and you've lost your son. His parents had been talking to him through their teeth the whole time. His father told him at once that he had been with his. He swore harshly. He wouldn't live. I'm all alone, Caleb cried. What have I achieved? I betrayed everyone, and I thought no one would ever do that to me. Only now did Caleb realize that Valerie had done to him what he had done to Jeanette. She wouldn't let him take care of her daughter, always yelling that it was her baby. I can't take it anymore, he got out of the car and went home. Valerie was already waiting for him there with a complaint. Where were you? Like a mad woman, she shouted. Did you find yourself a younger woman? I'm with the baby, and you? She waved her hands in front of her husband. Valerie, I'm filing for divorce. I've had enough. You're unbearable. You're impossible to live with. Someone needs something other than me. You idiot. I'm the one who's put up with you for almost four years, Caleb said coldly. I don't care what you think. It's over. I'm leaving. Valerie called her husband the very last words. Naturally, she couldn't accept that it was her fault. She'd made up a legend about him, that he'd cheated on her but Caleb didn't care anymore. He asked his parents for asylum. His mother persuaded his father and he let him in. Valerie, of course, in this situation was not confused, requested a huge alimony for her daughter. In court, of course, she was not able to achieve the payment of alimony. Alimony ex-wife, as it was supposed to be according to the law. And Caleb had been living in a completely different part of town all this time. He moved his workshop away from his old home, so he and Jeanette never crossed paths. He never went downtown. He wasn't interested. His father had told him there were rumors that Jeanette had married Edwin. I've missed such a woman, he cursed. I never thought my son would turn out to be such a fool. It was a cool October day. Caleb decided to take a walk around the town. He was a free man now. He went into a small cafe and immediately heard loud laughter. He turned in the direction it was coming from. Jeanette was sitting at the table with the baby in her arms. Dad, order me another milkshake and Jerome a strawberry, he heard the teenager's voice. Caleb looked closer and recognized him as Daniel. The man immediately turned away and headed for the exit. He took one last look at the people he'd once loved. 
Edwin came to the table with a tray and set everything down. Then he took the baby boy in his arms. Jeanette kissed him. She looked happily at the two teenagers and laughed merrily. God, it hurts, Caleb whispered. I ruined my happiness with my own hands. I had everything. And now it's empty. He hurried to his car. He was sorry he'd ever given up on Daniel. Even if Jeanette had married, he would have had a son. And now Daniel was calling another man Daddy Edwin. Ricky, come here, Daniel called to his younger brother. Dad, give it to me, he asked his father. Daniel had once thought that a long time ago he had lost the most precious thing in his life, his family. He had never imagined that this loss would lead to the arrival of his best friend and brother, Jerome, and then a little brother, Ricky. And that one day he would call Edwin father and never regret it. Daniel held the baby in his arms and smiled contentedly. Jerome sat up next to him and began to play with his baby brother. The parents looked at them and rejoiced. Here it is, the long-awaited happiness. But you understood what you had to do? Yes? Emily asked sternly, looking straight into the eyes of the confused Helene. Let's go over it again. The food must be prepared three times a day. Everything must be fresh, yesterday or this morning. Matthew won't eat any more. Load the laundry every day, too. We get things dirty all the time. Walk twice a day. If Matthew still asks to go outside, tell him I forbid it. He can't get cold. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Archie's room needs to be wet cleaned every day. My boy really doesn't like dust. The other rooms need to be cleaned every three days. Okay, you'll figure out the rest as you go along. I've got to run. I'll see you tonight. Yes, Ellen thought to herself. And change the cat's litter, walk the dog, clean the rabbit's cage. When did they manage all that without a housekeeper? I thought the ad said they only needed a caregiver, but there's a whole bunch of them. Ellen had no choice, though. She was happy that she could get this job with no experience and no education. It was almost unrealistic. And the salary, compared to what a girl could earn half a day, working as a waitress in a cafe or a saleswoman in a supermarket, was very decent. Only for someone like Ellen, of course. In fact, Emily had saved a lot of money by hiring her disabled husband a caregiver off the street and with no experience. There was a lot more money to be made for such hellish daily labor, but that didn't bother Ellen. Most importantly, Emily gave her a room in the house. After graduation from the orphanage, the girl stood in line for housing, but the queue moved very slowly. Therefore, that Ellen will get an apartment in the coming years did not count on that. And it was very expensive to rent a place. No salary would be enough for that. She found a job through an ad. Even a few weeks before graduation, unlike many of her peers who had already reached adulthood, Ellen realized that after graduation she had nowhere to go and nothing to live on. The girl covered hundreds of ads before she found something really suitable. A job as a shift worker with accommodation would hardly suit her. Constantly traveling around the cities was not part of her plans. But a nurse for a paralyzed man, that's what she needed. And the amount specified in the ad also pleased her. Oh, my girl wailed Vivian, the teacher who had been like a mother to Ellen all her life. I'm not sure it's a good idea. What if this so-called poor, poor, unfortunate, paralyzed uncle turns out to be some kind of pervert will start molesting you? Do you know how many cases like that there are? Don't worry, Ellen smiled. I'll figure it out somehow. And I don't think it's that bad. I think it's a good chance to save up some money and make a name for yourself. It's easier with money. They give you a place to stay and no deductions from your paycheck. What could be better? Housing is very expensive now. It's too expensive to rent. So I'll work for them until I get my own apartment. And by then I'll have some savings. I'll go to school and then life will settle down. You should drink honey with your mouth Vivian sighed. Okay, if anything goes wrong, call me right away and drop everything. And know that if anything goes wrong, you have a place to go. And don't you dare think you don't. You got it. I'll always have food for you, too. And I'll help you in life any way I can. You're like a daughter to me, Ellen, and I'll never leave you in trouble. And I will cry and laugh with you in joy, too. Vivian treated all the children in the orphanage well, 
and not only Helen could count on her help and support, but unlike the other boys, the girl did not have a single relative, not a single soulmate. To whom could she even come to spend the night? She was a foundling. Other pupils of the orphanage were also orphans, but they ended up in these walls for different reasons. All of them had parents in the past, some of them were abandoned because they couldn't afford it financially. Some of them were deprived of parental rights and their relatives couldn't take them away for one reason or another. Some of the kids had family visits, but Ellen didn't. She was all alone, the only girl in the group whose parents never showed up. And why would they suddenly remember about their own daughter, whom they had thrown out like a dog and thrown at the door of the orphanage? Ellen knew her fate, but she never complained about life. If they had done that, she reasoned, they must have had their reasons. When Vivian asked if Ellen wanted to track down her relatives and find out who she was in general and where she came from, the girl replied if they had wanted to find me, they would certainly have looked for me themselves. And since this did not happen, then I will live on my own. After all, there are not many orphans in the world. They live somehow. I shall live too. Helene was also very fond of Vivian. She was the only person close to her. But to sit on the woman's neck, and even more so to wait for the weather, the girl did not want to. Ellen realized that she would have to carve out her own place in the sun parents who will bring her everything on a silver platter. She has no, no, she couldn't count on anyone. A job in a rich house came in handy. Ellen was sure that it would help her to save enough money to somehow secure her future while she would get an education and get on her feet. So the girl tolerated absolutely everything. About what a difficult family she fell into, Ellen realized from the very first day of her service in the house. Emily clearly had no love for her husband, who was left disabled after an automobile accident. It was a confusing and murky affair, the details of which the man did not like to go into. And Ellen, and did not ask what right she has to meddle in household affairs, yes, no, still fired, and not blink an eye. Did she want that? Archie, Emily's son, was of course a fruit. He was the hardest thing Ellen had to deal with. Spoiled boy, who loved in this life only money, began to reach out his hands to the young nurse from the very first day. And the working conditions promised to improve and get rid of cleaning, and much more. And when he realized that Ellen was not going to share his bed with him, he even dared to threaten. Yes, if I want, your mother will throw you out of here in no time, squinted the young man, when once again tried to pull Helen into bed, but received a harsh rebuff. Who do you think they'll believe? Me, my own son? Or you, the penniless orphanage nurse who's been here for a week? Emily was very strict. Ellen realized she was caught between two fires. Archie's refusal could have unpredictable consequences for her, but so could agreeing to it. And Ellen wasn't going to fall for the first man she met, even if he was the son of a millionaire. Why would a girl dream of meeting her true love? And only then to trust a man. Archie was absolutely indifferent to her, and certainly not suitable for the role of her first lover. The situation could have gone too far, but fortunately Ellen was lucky. Matthew began to press his son about getting married. These conversations had been going on for quite some time. The man wanted his son to settle down and learn to take responsibility before he entrusted him with the first stake in his company. When Archie smelled something hot, he began to behave quieter than water and lower than grass. He realized that in addition to his mother, there was his father. And he was much more influential than Emily, who had spent her whole life sitting on her husband's neck. Matthew clearly sympathized with his nurse. Ellen seemed to him a good and decent girl. She looked after him with such care and diligence, fulfilling his every request, that she was able to win his trust at once. Archie realized that if there was a scandal in the family, it was unlikely that his father would take his side. Matthew knew his son too well, and if Ellen had not complained to him, he would have believed her rather than Archie. So the young man had no choice but to keep quiet and not spoil his relationship with his father, who was already strained to the breaking point over some nonsense especially since a suitable bride who suited both father and mother had long ago been found. Nailey, a beautiful and clever girl from an equally wealthy and respected family. Matthew had long wanted to be related to the girl's father, Max. Long before the accident, they had repeatedly discussed how great it would be if their children married. Archie and Nailey knew each other only superficially. Naturally, there was no question of any feelings between the young people, and how could there be any, if only at the behest of their parents? 
but such an early and even almost forced marriage in Archie's plans was definitely not included. That's why the young man tried to do his best to divert his father's attention from this problem, as Matthew himself thought. His father was going to go to some foreign clinic Archie remembered when he and his mother had discussed his future. He'd said he'd let things wait, that he needed to get back on his feet first. What had happened now? Why did he suddenly remember this stupid wedding? What had gotten into his head? I don't know, Emily sighed. But you realize that whatever it is, we're going to have to adjust to him. If he thinks it's time for you to get married, then it's time to change his mind. There's certainly nothing I can do. He's been mean enough lately. Anything he says to me, he's not like that. I think they've already hired a nurse for him, this Ellen. She entertains him as much as she can, reads books to him, but he's not happy. Well, son, don't worry. If you don't want to get married at all, we'll try to work something out. Although I don't think we'll be able to get your father's attention elsewhere. He seems to have some plans of his own that he's not going to share with us. So we need to find out what they are. Or are you suggesting we just sit on our hands? Archie was indignant. And yes, remind him about the clinic. Maybe he'll get distracted and forget about me, at least temporarily. His health is more important than his son's marriage. It would be nice to get him out of the country. We could send Helene with him. Let them run him around, take the ducks out for him, and we'll have a little peace of mind. Emily and Archie had slept and dreamed of sending their father away before. They depended on Matthew for everything and hated him quietly at the same time. Archie because his father was always telling him how to live his life, trying to put his outrageous son in some kind of framework. And Emily for the fact that she'd never been able to get full access to all his money, even though that was the reason she'd once tied her life to him. Matthew's money didn't just fall on his head. He had inherited capital and fortune from his father, who had been in the grave for several years now. In Emily's opinion, he wasn't a gift either, but fortunately she didn't cross paths with her father-in-law, who had been ill for the last few years. The man wasn't much for family gatherings. The daughter-in-law's relationship with her late mother-in-law also always left much to be desired. His parents did not understand how their son could tie his fate to this, as they put it, commoner. Matthew received a part of his father's capital when he was still very young, and on condition that not a penny of this money would not go into Emily's direct ownership. The woman hoped that in time her husband would share the capital with her. After all, she bore him a son, devoted her whole life to him. But Matthew did not need it. The man was completely uninterested in his wife having any assets of her own. He was never going to leave the family, and in a family, as it was customary, everything was shared. How much he didn't know about his wife and had no idea what she was really like. The man blindly believed Emily because at one time long ago when he was bad and unbearably painful, she supported him so much. He believed that she had done it out of the sincerest of motives, and he couldn't even think of the fact that this lady had it all figured out down to the smallest detail. Emily had always been so savvy and sneaky. Since her teenage years, she was able to see her own advantage in everything and extract it from any situation. She did not miss the opportunity to tame a lucrative fiancé, who met on her way by chance at that time in her life. He was so depressed that the elementary female support was for Matthew was not a whim, but a necessity. This, and took advantage of the cunning Emily, who took the most direct part in his tragedy. And although all these events have long since faded into oblivion, the woman always remembered that her position hangs in the balance. All the assets and finances in the family still belonged only to her husband, and she remained in the second role. This situation did not suit Emily at all. She hoped that after Archie's marriage, some of her husband's money would be in his hands, and then in hers. So it was in her interest to marry her son, too. Archie was the only one who didn't like it, and he urged his mother to postpone the engagement and marriage. Emily gave in to her son to avoid arguing with him. In fact, she wasn't going to change her husband's mind that Archie should get married. A trip to a clinic where Matthew could be put back on his feet was of absolutely no interest to Emily. She liked him much better as an invalid. At least since Matthew had lost the ability to walk on his own and had become completely dependent on his wife and son for both physical and mental support, Emily's situation had improved. She could spend money more freely than before and not have to account for every penny. Matthew was rich, 
but he always treated money responsibly and meticulously. He taught his family, who did not like strict restrictions, to do the same. Emily all the more dreamed of living as the wives of millionaires, and not only on paper to be such. The woman was able to do this only after her husband was in an accident and stopped so carefully watching the finances as before. Until then, Emily's life could not be called modest, but for every ruble spent, the woman had to account for it. Her husband did not deny her good clothes, expensive cosmetics, and other pleasures of life. But Emily was terribly annoyed by the fact that Matthew demanded to record all purchases and provide receipts. At such moments, the woman felt like a beggar. It depressed her. And Emily secretly hated her principled husband, who shook over his gold like a miser. Emily didn't have to remind Matthew that he wanted to go to a foreign clinic for treatment. When he summoned his wife for a serious talk to discuss his upcoming engagement and other important matters, he remembered it himself and had already called and talked to several doctors, the man said. Emailed them my scans, test results. One of the clinics is ready to accept me, but I think it would be better to do the operation after Max gets married. I'd hate to miss my son's wedding. Well, Emily sighed, listening to her husband. You know best. How are you feeling? I'm fine. How can I feel? Matthew grinned sadly. It's hard to talk about normal without legs, but in general, yes, I don't have any pain. And you found me a wonderful nurse. She's young, but she's so quick to do anything I want her to do. If I ask, it's done in a split second. It's true what they say. It's not the experience that counts as much as the attitude. Helene is very good. I can't get enough of her. Any other woman in Emily's shoes would have tensed up as she'd heard such flattering words about a young girl who spent more time with her husband than she did. But the woman was perfectly calm. It was possible that Matthew might have had feelings for Ellen, but they were not love feelings, but paternal ones. Emily had no doubt that the girl had told him about her hard fate. She liked to talk about it so much that it seemed to Ellen a special pleasure to share the fact that she was an orphan who had gone through all the hardships of orphanage life. Emily judged everyone from the bell tower of her own experience. Her opinion of Ellen was as biased and unfair as any other person she'd ever met. That was her nature. Nothing could be done about it. In fact, in Ellen's case, it was exactly the opposite. She never exploited her orphanage past, but she didn't see the point in hiding it either. That's why she told about herself openly, as it is, without holding anything back. With her sincerity, she won Matthew, who lacked soulfulness when he was with his wife and son. Neither Emily nor Archie could give Matthew real human warmth, and he understood that. Over the years, his wife had finally turned into a mercantile person who was interested not so much in the financial situation of the family as in her own profit. And the son, under her strict and unrelenting supervision, grew up the most real egoist. Yes, they have always been and will always be his family, and Matthew will never leave them, but not because he doesn't have that option, but because in his worldview, Family is sacred. It's something that's once and for all. And Emily and Archie are his wife and son. And they'll be together for the rest of their lives, even though they've had nothing to do with each other but money and a shared roof over their heads for a long time. And the warmth of their hearts. Well, it was good to have Ellen in Matthew's life. The man was genuinely glad of it. She made up for Matthew's lack of human companionship, which his wife and son were simply unable to give him. But the man had no feelings for Ellen other than paternal. He was not the kind of man who fell for young girls. He sincerely felt sorry for the orphan, who had never known neither parental love, nor care, nor support, nor warmth. And he even seriously considered giving her part of his fortune in gratitude for her faithful and loyal service. But nothing more. There could be no relationship between them. And with a wife a man would hardly be capable of any relationship. Of course, deep down, he sincerely hoped that sooner or later the specialists of the foreign clinic would put him on his feet. But when else would it be? The most important thing for him now was the upcoming engagement. Matthew had already had time to discuss the date of the celebration with Max. All that remained was to send out invitations to the guests and choose a suitable place for the celebration. Emily was nervous. She'd never been so nervous in her life. Archie looked utterly depressed. All his hopes for a better future and a life of peace and quiet had been dashed in an instant when his father had called him in and told him that he and Max had made up their minds. Couldn't you have talked him out of it? He asked his mother reproachfully. 
You promised. I didn't promise you anything. Emily snapped at him. She was deeply angered by her son's claims. She realized that the young man had become quite insolent. He had nothing to reproach her for but her. She already did everything she could for Archie. But she wasn't going to do herself any harm, and she wasn't going to let her son bring some available girl into the house, as he'd had plenty in his bed. Emily, like Matthew, was quite happy with Naley's candidacy. The most important thing was that she was controllable and predictable, just like Archie. The woman wasn't going to give her son any freedom. She dreamed of controlling the man's capital, his hands. And for this, next to Archie had to be a quiet, calm girl who understands nothing about business and does not want to delve into the subtleties and nuances of such a complex case. Naley was just such a girl. Of course, her father insisted that his daughter received a decent education, but this interest of the girl to study and labor and limited. She dreamed of a large and strong family of children in a cozy home, building a career and doing business was not part of her plans. She dreamed that all the responsibility for providing for the family was taken by her husband. And who was she born like that? Max grinned, and she was so docile and obedient. She's grown up, but she's not a bride, but just gold. I'm sure she'll be a good wife to Max. Matthew was sure of that too, except that neither of them had asked Archie, who didn't want to get married. The young man was forced to nod and smile, to pretend that he was happy about the upcoming wedding. Archie realized that his father had taken up the task of arranging his family life and would not leave him so easily. On the whole, he liked Naley. Not enough to commit his life to her, of course. Truth be told, Archie didn't want to be involved with anyone for a long time. But since his father had chosen this particular girl for him, well, the young man had only to accept it. Once it was decided, he would marry her. What can't you do for an inheritance? The engagement took place in a pleasant and friendly atmosphere. Immediately afterward, the preparations for the wedding began in earnest, much of it on the shoulders of Ellen and her driver Vincent. All day long, Ellen spent her time shopping, selecting the decor for the festivities. Emily, Archie, and Matthew couldn't decide where they wanted to celebrate the engagement. The wife and son realized that it would be too hard for a man to spend a whole evening in such a fuss, and even outside the house. Therefore, the family decided that the best option would be to celebrate the engagement at home. Archie immediately agreed, and Emily didn't mind. We just need to get everything ready, she said. I'll do the menu and Archie will help me. Of course, Emily wasn't going to do the cooking and serving. She had no idea how to do it. The woman decided to hire Ellen, not just anyone. Yes, she could have hired a cook or ordered food from a restaurant. But no, Emily was paying money to this girl. And lately, the woman was not satisfied with the fact that all of poor Ellen's work was reduced to heartfelt conversations with Matthew, walks, and the usual household chores. Emily wanted to squeeze everything out of Ellen to the fullest. Therefore, as soon as it was decided to celebrate the engagement at home, the woman immediately asked if Ellen could cook. What could she say? The orphanage had always had female workers cooking, and Ellen had not been hired to do it. But she didn't want to argue with Emily, so she said she could cook. Counting on the fact that the woman planned to put on the table the simplest dishes, such as Olivia or herring under a fur coat, baked meat with potatoes, sandwiches, or something like that. Emily gave Ellen a whole list of foods to stock the refrigerator with a few days before the party. I'll order some more things on the day of the party, the woman said. And you can start shopping. Vincent will take you everywhere. The middle-aged man clearly felt out of place. It was obvious from his demeanor that he wasn't too happy about his fate. The job as a simple driver clearly did not suit him. Despite his young age, Ellen was a good judge of character, and she could see right through Vincent. He was too ambitious. He was too ambitious. But she didn't know why he'd never made it in the world. However, these were just her thoughts, which had no confirmation. But only for the time being, until Ellen became a random witness of a conversation that put everything in its place. Of course, she had realized from the beginning that she had taken a job with a difficult family. But she couldn't have imagined the intrigue that raged in that house. Turns out Vincent has been working for Emily and Matthew for years. It looks like there was more than just an employer-employee working relationship between Emily and Vincent. It would seem that what is common between the wife of a millionaire and a simple driver who never realized his ambitions. 
but the situation was much more complicated than it might seem at first glance. And when Ellen accidentally learned about the true state of affairs, everything fell into place. What she heard was not just information, but a real-time bomb, depending on how it was presented and what to do with it next. That's what Ellen had to decide. And much, if not everything, depended on her decision. Emily and Vincent had known each other for a long time since they were very young. Growing up in a dysfunctional environment, they had been inseparable since their youth. Neither Emily nor Vincent had any desire to study or work. The only thing they were interested in was money. But they were not going to earn honestly, and it was scary to go to crime. For a long time, nothing happened, until everything happened by itself. After graduating from high school, Emily went to medical school. Vincent was very surprised by this choice. He didn't understand why she had spent so many years studying to become a doctor. Emily clearly didn't plan to work. But when Vincent asked her why she was studying and why she was going there, she laughed. You understand a lot, you fool. It's not the easiest profession, of course, but if I work in a hospital, at least I won't starve. And in general, this business is so useful, drugs there are all sorts of. Always useful. Maybe I'm not only good as a hospital worker, who knows? And she was indeed not just a hospital worker. Emily was a master of intrigue. Before graduating from college, she got a job at one of the best hospitals in the city. There she met Matthew, who was then still a very young man. But the tragedy did not bypass him, leaving an indelible trace in his soul. At that moment, he was so in need of support that he was ready to believe the first person he met. Such was Emily, who almost immediately managed to take the place of his tragically departed wife in his heart. Before meeting her, Matthew was already married. That marriage was arranged by his father but he had always treated Liz with respect and understanding. She wasn't his first love, but he married her anyway because Liz was a girl from their circle. And besides, she loved him. In some ways, they were even similar to Naley, as she was now. Back then, Liz had dreamed of being a good wife to Matthew and was doing her best to do so, and Matthew had accepted that love. There was nothing else for him to do. Their marriage could be quite happy. Matthew planned to spend the rest of his life with Liz, and she'd gotten pregnant quickly, which pleased her father. The grandchild will be the heir the man had said then. It was good that Liz had her priorities straight. It's a good thing you two got married. The pregnancy was going well. Matthew was already well on his way to becoming a father. Despite his young age, he was excited that he and Liz would be having a baby very soon. He was sure it was only the firstborn. There would be more to come, as they say. Unlike his father, he wasn't too worried about whether it would be a son or a daughter. Matthew would have been happy with either. He didn't really care. Liz, of course, was eager to give her beloved husband a son. Matthew's father-in-law also dreamed of a grandson. But a girl was to be born, and that was wonderful. But fate turned out to be cruel and unfair to their family. At a certain point, something went wrong. Towards the end of her pregnancy, Liz began to feel worse and worse, often fainted, she had a poor appetite. The young woman could hardly move around. In her seventh month, she went into premature labor. Of course, Matthew immediately took his wife to the hospital, where doctors fought for her life and the life of the life of their little daughter for several hours. What? What is it? Matthew exclaimed, grabbing a passing nurse by the sleeve. Why is the doctor gone so long? Why won't anyone tell me anything? What the hell is going on? What's wrong with my wife and my baby? The nurse that the young man had so unceremoniously stopped in the hallway was Emily. She did her best to calm down the raging Matthew, who suspected that something was not being told to him. You see, this is my wife's and my first child, he said, not even noticing how he clung to the nurse's hand and stared into her eyes. Our first baby girl, she has to come into the world. She has to be okay. There's no other way around it. Tell me, what's going on? What's taking so long? What's wrong with my wife? I need to know. I have a right to know. At this point, Emily herself didn't know what was wrong with Liz. The doctor was literally working her ass off. She had even had to call in another obstetrician for a scheduled delivery because the woman just couldn't get away from a patient who was on the verge of life and death. You know, Emily said, I can't tell you anything right now, but if you want, we can talk to you for a little while longer. You need to drink some water and calm down. I'll get you some. Don't worry. 
Childbirth is a very complicated and unpredictable process. Things happen. But I'm sure your wife and daughter will be fine, Emily said. You just said yourself that it can't be otherwise. I did. I did, Matthew sighed, already sensing something terrible. His heart was racing, and he couldn't calm down. Even a conversation with the nurse and a glass of ice water didn't help him. In the short time they'd been sitting on the bench outside the hospital rooms, Matthew had told Emily enough to make her realize how wealthy he was. The man kept lamenting that he and his family had a lot of money, and they were willing to give the last of it if nothing could happen to his wife and baby. But it was impossible to save them. Their conversation was interrupted by Amanda, a doctor who came out of the operating room. Where are you going? The woman exclaimed indignantly. What's going on at all? This isn't a psychological service, it's a hospital. Come here quickly. I need your help. What's going on? Matthew intervened. Is something wrong with my wife? Sit still and wait the doctor, who was already nervous, cut him off. I told you right away that the case is very complicated. Wait, we'll explain everything to you later. At that moment, Matthew was ready to fight. If he hadn't been so well-mannered, he would have clung to the nervous woman and shaken her until she answered him. But he didn't, purely because he was a very intelligent man. Matthew had no choice but to wait. And as it seemed to him at the time, this waiting would last forever. Every second he lived in the unknown was very difficult for him. He could not even imagine that at that very moment, when he was sitting in the corridor and could not find a place for himself, the nurse and the doctor cynically and indifferently decide not only his fate, but also determine the fate of a little premature girl. Vanessa, but you saw him yourself. Emily reasoned, persuading the doctor, with whom she was on very good terms, and if I may say so on good terms, to lie to the man. Emily insisted that the woman tell Matthew that it was not only his wife who could not be saved, but his daughter too. This monstrous plan matured in her mind instantly. Of course, Emily couldn't be 100% sure that Matthew would pay any attention to her, and she had a chance of attracting him to her, but she gave herself her word that she would do everything she could to make it happen. He's just a young man, Emily continued. And such a tragedy. Yes, if he has any reminder of her, he'll spend the rest of his life wondering what he'll do alone with a child. Please have pity on him, if he buries them both. It'll all be forgotten soon enough. He can rebuild his life. He'll still be fine with another woman. Emily smirked. Vanessa, what's your interest in all this? Do you have a crush on him or something? It's funny. He's got a wealthy family. He won't even look at you for who you are. Just a nurse. Who cares? Emily was outraged. You're just doing a good deed. What do you care? What do you call doing a good deed? The woman grinned bitterly. When the father is alive and even so wealthy, to give his daughter to the orphanage. You surprise me too. I'm listening to you and I don't even know whether to cry or laugh. Emily still managed to convince Vanessa to do as she asked. After all, she was partly right, and the woman realized it. That day, a stillborn baby girl had been born to a woman who was planning to give up her baby. She was given to Matthew along with his wife's body. Matthew's own baby girl was dropped off right at the door of the orphanage. Emily was insanely grateful for Vanessa's help. She certainly couldn't have done it without her. She'd been waiting outside the doctor's office for half an hour. Emily knew what condition he'd come out of there in. He'd lose both his wife and his daughter in one day. Who could take that? Emily didn't want to waste a second. This was the perfect moment to take Matthew on, and she was taking advantage of it. Would anyone else in her position have done anything differently? I don't think so. I know you've been through such a terrible ordeal, Emily wailed as Matthew left the doctor's office. It's a terrible thing to go through. But I want you to know that you can always, always count on my support, if there is anything I can do to help you. No one can help me now, Matthew sighed. And no one ever will. Please don't say that, Emily whispered, stroking his arm. That afternoon, Matthew asked her to go for a walk. He just couldn't be alone and his parents' reassurances weren't likely to help him. They needed to somehow support Liz's mother and father who had lost their only daughter. That was far more important than his, Matthew's, suffering. Emily, as they say, was in the right place at the right time. Matthew didn't neglect her company. Word had gotten around. After the walk, they exchanged phone numbers. 
Emily asked Matthew's permission to call him occasionally to see how he was doing. She did her best to pretend it was important to her. The fish was hooked, and Emily needed to build on what she had accomplished so quickly. She realized that Matthew was going to be hurting for a long time, and all the while she needed to be there for him so she wouldn't miss the moment when he was ready for something new in his life. After that walk in the park, they continued to call and see each other. Emily supported Matthew was there for him, and at first didn't demand anything from him. She cautiously, but very persistently went towards her goal. Of course, this was not to Vincent's liking, and he was jealous. He didn't understand why he had to share his beloved with anyone else. Of course, he lamented, sooner or later you will marry him and forget all about me. He is rich, and what do you need me for? If I'd known it would end like this, I'd never have gotten involved with you. I'll be alone and you'll be in the black. You bet. How could it be otherwise? It's only in fairy tales. But Emily loved Vincent, him alone. She only wanted Matthew for his own sake. Of course, she was truly sorry that things had turned out the way they had. She sympathized with him. But that sympathy had nothing to do with love, with the passion she'd felt only when she was with Vincent. But he didn't understand that. Vincent was offended that Emily was involved with a rich man who owed his entire fortune to his father. What is he in himself? He reasoned. Yes, he is not a fool, but there are many such not stupid and talented. But not everyone gets such money by birthright. If it wasn't for his father and his capital, he would be nothing at all. Just like everybody else. He'd be working, studying hard, trying to climb some heights. But we don't know if he'd have succeeded or if he'd have missed it all his life. Of course, with a dad like that, it's not hard to achieve something. If I had a father like that, I wouldn't be sitting here either. Vincent's jealousy grew more desperate and aggressive by the day. And there came a point when he grew tired of everything that was going on in his and Emily's lives. It happened soon enough. It hadn't even been a few months since Emily had started dating Matthew. She'd taken advantage of the fact that he needed the support he'd been needing since his wife's funeral and hadn't been embarrassed by the fact that the earth hadn't settled on his grave since then and climbed into bed with him. Vincent couldn't take it anymore, though Emily sincerely didn't understand his resentment. How do you envision us living together? She wondered when Vincent had flared up after he'd learned of their intimacy. Am I going to lie on the other side of the bed and look at him? Is that it? But no, of course not. That's impossible. Come on, calm down. It's no big deal. You and I are going to be rich soon. How can I compare to that fool? A part of his fortune and we'll be fine. But Vincent didn't want to wait for that. He decided to break up with Emily and erase from his life and memory everything that was connected with her. When she heard about it, she only grinned. Well, and live on in poverty, she said wryly. Such a smart and proven as me you will find. You fool. I have developed such a plan and almost realized it. And you decided to get away at the most interesting place. Well, as they say, flag in your hands, a drum around your neck and a fair wind I won't keep you. A few weeks after they broke up, Emily found out she was expecting a baby. The news came in handy. By that time, Matthew, who realized that he could not be alone, was almost to the point where he could propose to Emily. Even his parents' protest couldn't sway him. Of course, his father was ashamed of his son for not even being able to mourn his late wife for a year. But at the same time, he realized that, quite possibly, it would be better for his son faster the deep soul wound would heal, the pain would subside, he would feel better, and he would be able to start living again. Of course, the man was not thrilled with Emily and gave Matthew a strict condition that all assets and finances that are in his possession and will be transferred to him in the future will not become jointly acquired property. At that moment, Matthew was least interested in that. He didn't know where to escape the terrible grief that haunted him both day and night. When he married Liz, his father was just beginning to bring him up to speed on his affairs. Matthew had almost no capital rights, but a son was soon to be born. It was a trump card Emily planned to use to her advantage. True, she never succeeded in doing so, but the woman did not give up trying for many years. She and Matthew lived a good life. But sometime after the wedding, Vincent loomed on Emily's horizon again. She was right, he couldn't do it without her. After they broke up, all he could think about was her. And she hadn't forgotten him. It hadn't been that long, and a love this strong doesn't fade so quickly. It's unrealistic. 
They started talking, meeting in secret. Vincent immediately guessed whose son was sleeping in his lover's stroller. By then he'd calmed down. Vincent now realized that Emily had indeed drawn the lucky ticket. He had accepted Emily's marriage. The role of lover suited him just fine, since he couldn't see any way to get anywhere near the kind of financial security Matthew had. But I can't do that either, he said. I want to be a little closer to you. Can't you think of anything? Emily could have gotten Vincent a job at her in her husband's house. But she was afraid of that. If Matthew found out about her affair, he wouldn't forgive her and let it go. But after a while, she decided to go through with it. Meeting Vincent on neutral territory was even riskier. And if he worked for her and her husband, there would be a much better chance of hiding their affair. Vincent would seem to be on hand at all times, but at the same time he would be a completely insignificant and unnoticeable figure. No one would think anything of him. What could connect the wife of such a successful and wealthy man and, for example, a driver? Emily had easily persuaded her husband to hire her a personal driver. She told him about Vincent, that he was a former classmate of hers whose mother was ill. He needed money, and it was hard to find a decent job with adequate pay without experience and education. Matthew took her at her word, didn't bother to ask her who Vincent was or how she knew him. It wasn't his style. His father liked to do that sort of thing, and Matthew preferred to take people at their word, at least those he lived under the same roof with. Of course, Emily and Vincent's relationship wasn't as stormy and passionate as it had been. But as soon as the woman had a moment to spare, she'd go to bed with her lover. Emily did it every chance she got. Vincent was her personal driver. Her husband, of course, had no control over her trips to the city or any of the other places she visited. It was time enough for solitude. And so it went on for many years. His son grew up in front of his eyes, his beloved woman by his side. Vincent earned a very decent salary, but it wasn't enough for him. He still felt inadequate, and it was hard to imagine what any other normal man would feel if he were in that situation. Gradually, Vincent grew bored with his life. He wanted everything to be like normal people, a house, a family, a wife, a child. But that was impossible, and he realized it. Impossible, at least not while Matthew was alive. If Emily had been a widow, and a rich widow at that, their lives might have been very different. She and Archie would inherit Matthew's entire fortune. Emily would have found the right words to tell Archie who his real father was. It would be a different life from the hopeless routine Vincent had been forced to live in for so many years. It was a thought that came to him more and more often, and it frightened him. Sometimes Vincent wondered if he really was such a bastard that he could sincerely wish for the death of another person. And to whom? On the husband of his mistress, who had given her absolutely everything and raised her and his son as his own. It was creepy and unthinkable, but ideas never just went out of Vincent's head. He wasn't the kind of man to give up easily. And the day Ellen overheard him talking to Emily, the man had confessed to his mistress that he'd caused the fatal accident that had left Matthew unable to move on his own. At first, the lovers began to fight. Vincent once again rebuked Emily. I've told you many times that I can't do this anymore, he sighed. But have you ever heard me? Tell me seriously, have you ever once in your life thought about how I feel? I used to be able to do everything perfectly well, Emily said. I've lived so many years, and I've lived the wrong kind of life. I mean, I never complained about life, and then all of a sudden you're not happy with it anymore. If you, as you put it, you don't like the role so much. Why didn't you go out and earn money yourself? You could have gotten a job from scratch if you wanted to, but you didn't want anything. You're used to holding onto my skirt, and that's all you're good for. Well, Vincent left, but he came back, of course. What could be easier than hiding behind a woman's back? Really, Vincent? Emily said wryly. The man convinced Emily that she was wrong, and that he really loved her. He couldn't imagine his life without her. She pretended to believe it, realizing that she and he were bound together for the rest of their lives by a thin, invisible thread of secrecy that Matthew could never know. They talked and talked, arguing, 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 discussing the future. Until Vincent accidentally blurted it out. He didn't even realize how it happened. But when he saw the frightened eyes of his beloved, he realized that he had said too much. But it was too late to change anything. What do you mean? Emily asked warily when Vincent exclaimed that he'd already tried to help her. 
but it hadn't worked. What kind of help are we talking about? What have you done? What have you done that I don't know about? The man hesitated. It's just something I said. I meant. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. I love you very much and I hope that after Archie's wedding we can finally be free. You can't imagine how much I'm looking forward to it and how much I want it. I'm counting the days until then. But Emily wasn't satisfied with Vincent's excuses. She guessed what he'd almost blurted out. And that was it. She thought as she replayed the terrible day her husband had almost died. Matthew's car had broken down and he had to get to a business meeting. Except Vincent wasn't around at the time. He told Emily that he was going away on some business and wouldn't be back until later that evening, she asked. Why he wasn't taking the car. To which the man replied that he didn't want to stand in traffic. Emily didn't think much of it at the time. Vincent said that he supposedly wanted to prepare her some kind of surprise. And after everything that had happened, it didn't matter. And the little details of that day, which she'd been able to put together so quickly and easily, had slipped her mind. Matthew had no choice but to use the automobile, in which his wife usually traveled with the driver. What about you? He asked then. Or are you not going out tonight? I'll stay home, Emily smiled. You go. It's okay if I need to go somewhere in a hurry. I'll call a cab. I don't think so. The man never made it to his destination. Two hours later, Emily heard the alarmed voice of the doctor on duty. Matthew had lost control of his car and had been in a terrible accident. He was near death, underwent several surgeries, but could not get back on his feet. Doctors promise that in time the situation will change. But we don't know how long we'll have to wait. How did you set all this up? Emily whispered, remembering Vincent's words. Of course I did. Why wouldn't Matthew be able to control the car? He'd always been a great driver, never had a chauffeur. Emily was seething with rage, but not so much because of the fact that her lover had almost sent her husband to the grave, but because of the realization that she could have been in that car on that fateful day. What were you thinking? She was outraged. What if I had crashed? What if Archie had? I can't even imagine what might have happened if something had gone wrong. Vincent, how could you? What was going through your head at that moment? Vincent didn't expect it to be so stupid. He had no idea he'd turn himself in and do it in such a ridiculous way. He couldn't understand what was going on, and Emily couldn't understand how he'd ever come up with such a monstrous idea. After a few moments of silence, Vincent began to justify himself. He said that he'd disabled Matthew's car on purpose, just as he had ruined his own car. No one else but he would have driven the car that day that was going to crash. He'd calculated everything, thought it all through to the smallest detail. Vincent was good with cars, and he was sure that even with careful inspection it was impossible to see anything. He was right about that. Everything had been done and set up so finely that there was no doubt in anyone's mind that it had been an accident. But how could he have taken such a risk? Emily couldn't figure it out. After that, she didn't know how she was going to communicate with Vincent. She was scared. I've told you more than once that I can't do this anymore, Vincent continued and I really don't understand why you're making that face right now. Like it's all my fault. It's just as much your fault for what happened. Do you think it's easy for him to watch him lock himself in the bedroom with you all these years, to listen to him lecture my son, who could have been raised by me and do it the way I see fit? I remember you married him for a purpose, but you never got anywhere. So what is it? You've lived with him all these years for nothing. Emily sighed. She couldn't get this conversation out of her head she hadn't even realized that Ellen had accidentally witnessed the conversation. The girl herself was at a complete loss. She didn't know what to do next. Should she tell Matthew? She asked herself. What would I tell him? Ellen pondered. That she had overheard his wife and her driver talking? That she'd been cheating on him for years? And in general that she never had any love for him and she married him only for money? What if he doesn't believe her? And if Emily played him for a fool, he would make excuses for her, and I would be blamed for all my sins. Ellen's mind was full of questions she didn't know the answers to. She needed advice, so she decided to call Vivian. Oh, what's going on there, the woman sighed, having listened to her ward. And I told you right away not to go to work there. 
Are you afraid? And you didn't listen to me. The rich have their own quirks. But I feel sorry for the man, of course. And his wife is a rare scoundrel. You'd be hard pressed to find one. And his lover's no better either. But in your case, as they say, it's a two-way street and you don't know what to do. I don't think that Matthew is such a fool that after all these years he hasn't realized with whom he lives under the same roof. The other thing is, she's his wife. And if he hasn't left her by now, he won't. But to forgive someone like that, of course, you have to try. I would never forgive. I mean, you have to do that your whole life. She cheats on him, brought her lover into the house and almost in the marital bedroom with him, is having an affair. I'm afraid that he'll find some excuse for it, said Helen, and I'll be thrown out of the house. What would I do then? Where else am I going to get a job like that? She barely let me go today, saying that we were in the middle of wedding preparations and you were wandering around. She's all over me, you witch. Have we ever seen the like? Vivian said slowly. I've been thinking about this for a while. You should tell him about the conversation you overheard. Anyway, he has every right to know that his wife has a lover. And not just any lover, but a brazen scoundrel who's made a pass at him with his own money. What if he and Emily are up to something else? She's not living with Matthew for love. How many years has she been counting on his money? A lot. Exactly. What if she does listen to her fool Vincent and decides to poison her husband or worse? Well, it couldn't be worse. But who knows, if anything happens to him, you won't forgive yourself for not telling him. You never know what you can expect from them. They're evil and unpredictable, greedy people. They'll do anything, anything to get what they want. You know that yourself. I can see that you think the same way I do. So do it. What's stopping you? I know you're a good girl, and no job, no money is worth a human life to you. You're honest and fair, and I think you should do the right thing in this situation. Ellen was sure of that too, but she was still very scared. Such a serious and extremely unpleasant conversation, and practically on the eve of the engagement. She realized that Matthew would be very upset, and the upcoming celebration would probably have to be canceled. A huge scandal would erupt in the family, the outcome of which was unknown. It was unlikely, of course, that Matthew would decide to divorce, but it was still a long shot. Ellen did not yet know that Matthew had lost his daughter at Emily's mercy. She and Vincent had not broached the subject. It was only about Archie and the accident Vincent had caused. But as you know, all secrets come out sooner or later, especially when they come out at the most unexpected moment. Not having time to recover from one shock, Matthew was forced to face another. The man took Ellen's story seriously. She thought that the reaction would be completely different, more calm and restrained. After all, Matthew was not used to showing his emotions to a stranger, but he trusted Ellen, so he couldn't help himself. He said everything that was on his mind at that moment. But most importantly, he believed her. He didn't blame her for eavesdropping or spreading gossip. That was very important to Ellen. She didn't know what she would have done if the man had dismissed her story and started making excuses for his wife she'd probably fall through the ground. She would run away from the Lord's house and never return. Ellen had nothing to be ashamed of, and Matthew understood that. She had only opened his eyes to a truth that had been looming in front of his face for years. Yes, he thought to himself as he listened to the girl. I guess I was wrong to let Emily twist my arm like that. I was a naive fool to think that she was actually supporting me. Not without benefit to herself, of course, but still. And it turns out she was cynically cheating on me and with my son. It would seem that my only daughter is not mine either. But now I can see who Archie grew up to be as unscrupulous as his real father no shame and no conscience. Matthew was going to have a very serious conversation with his wife. And since Archie and Naley's engagement was to take place in the next few days, he had no time to prepare for it. Naturally, after what he had learned, a wedding or an inheritance was out of the question. Archie was not his son. But it wasn't just that. If he had grown up to be a decent and honorable man, it was possible that Matthew would have turned a blind eye to Emily's lies and not cut Archie out of his life. But the young man was what they called a worthy heir to his biological father. And that made Matthew very sad. So much so that he was clearly not willing to give Archie the daughter of his friend and give him a part of his capital to manage. Now the man knew what was going on, and he didn't need any other proof. Ellen's casual conversation had been more than enough. 
At first, Emily pretended not to understand what it was about. She was in shock. She hadn't expected things to turn out this way. She couldn't figure out how he knew everything. Who else but Vincent could have told him the truth? Emily couldn't believe her lover was stupid enough to set himself up like that. It didn't make sense to her. She denied it. But Matthew kept insisting. And when he suggested Emily take a DNA test, she realized there was no point in denying it. And there was no point in wasting time going to labs, especially since the results are known in advance. I'm glad you stopped denying the obvious, Matthew said. I thought you were going to continue to deny the obvious even after I asked you to take the test. It's a good thing you realized that it was useless. You wouldn't have been able to fake the test anyway. I wouldn't have let it happen. Just answer me one question, Emily. Why did you do this to me? Why did you lie to me for so many years? Why did I deserve to be treated like this? It's not like I've done anything wrong to you. She didn't know what to say to her husband. She didn't expect it to turn out this way. Of course, the main truth hadn't been revealed. But at that moment, when Matthew was speaking frankly and honestly with his wife, it occurred to him that their meeting at the hospital had not been a coincidence. He'd never before imagined that he would suspect Emily of anything. It had seemed to him that they had quite a happy and prosperous marriage and would live together all their lives. But he'd been wrong, 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 wrong. And now he had to correct that mistake. Of course, the man very much did not want to stir up a scandal and give cause for gossip. But he had absolutely no desire to continue living with Emily under the same roof. She hoped that her husband was mad and the situation would work itself out. But Matthew was adamant. Of course, I won't leave you or Archie on the street after the divorce, he said meaningfully. But the maintenance will be more than modest. And that's assuming I don't hear any other shocking news about you. It would be better if you told me everything yourself, right now. If you've done something else that is directly related to me and concerns me directly, then you'd better tell me yourself. I'll find out anyway. Emily didn't realize what her husband was implying. She had no idea what he was up to. Matthew decided to go to the end and find out in great detail what had happened in the maternity hospital many years ago. You're out of your mind, exclaimed the private detective he had hired when the man told him his task. Matthew didn't want to contact his security service. After everything he had learned, he had decided to completely change his environment, including all his employees including the guards and other people working for him. The man no longer had trust in anyone, especially those who had any contact with Emily. In other words, everyone who had surrounded him over the past few years. I need to know the truth, Matthew sighed, but I need to know the truth, you know. It's a matter of the utmost importance to me. I have a suspicion that they gave me the corpse of a completely different girl, not my daughter. Yes, she looked like my daughter, but all babies look alike. I'd really like to find out, you understand. I'll pay you well. I hope that at least you do not plan to tear up the grave, said the private detective. Well, you're exaggerating, the man replied. It's already some extremes, and it is, of course, excluded. I just want to know what happened at the maternity hospital. I think I have the right to do so, and after all, I am paying you money. So just please do what I'm asking you to do. No questions asked. You know what the private investigator thought to himself, but he didn't refuse the job, which was not surprising. Of course, who would turn down that kind of money? But digging up the information Matthew needed was not an easy task. And what could he charge the maternity ward staff with? The baby was stillborn and the mother was in the grave. The body of the daughter was given to the man, it would seem. But as you know, even walls have eyes and ears. And Vanessa was still working at that maternity hospital. She should be retired by now, but she couldn't let go of her job. Money was needed for her sin and complicity, the orphaning of a defenseless little girl. Fate had cruelly punished her. Her granddaughter suffered from the strongest pathology. There was no money for her treatment. She and her daughter worked double shifts and lived practically starving. Therefore, when the man offered Vanessa a substantial amount of money for the information he needed, she immediately agreed to help him and gave up Emily with all the guts. And herself, of course. After all, she was helping her. But the private detective gave Vanessa his word that no one would ever find out about it, and therefore she would not get anything for it. Vanessa took him at his word. The amount of money the private detective offered seemed very solid and attractive, 
and he, in turn, knew who to go to. He had found out in advance who was on duty that day, and how happy he was when it turned out that the same doctor is still working in the same maternity hospital. He thought to himself that he would not have to go to the addresses and look for her. In fact, the task was not as difficult as it seemed to the private detective at first glance. The man managed in a few days. And on the very day of Archie and Maley's engagement, which had to be canceled after everything that had happened, the private detective was ready to give Matthew all the information he needed. It just can't be, he whispered, scrutinizing all the documents he had been given. It's impossible. Perhaps it's impossible, said the private detective. That's for you to decide for yourself. I gave a lot of money for information there. So count with me, please, and I'll go. You're not the only one who wants to dig into the past. Sure, sure, Matthew mumbled, handing the man the envelope with the fee. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much you've helped me. My pleasure, the private investigator smiled. If you need anything else, don't hesitate to contact me. It took Matthew a long time to come to terms with the fact that fate had brought him and his daughter together so easily. He wished he'd thought of it sooner, blindly believing Emily and not even thinking about what a snake on his chest. God, how guilty I am in front of her. He pondered to himself, how guilty am I before my girl, who because of my stupidity and gullibility, spent all her conscious life in an orphanage. But nothing. I will surely make it up to her, repent before her, and she will forgive me. I'm sure of it. She has a good heart. I know that for a fact. Things will work out. Naturally, after all Matthew had learned about his daughter, any maintenance for Emily and Max was out of the question. It was a gesture of his goodwill, but his wife's act was beyond good and evil. Matthew wouldn't even listen to her explanation. He had absolutely no interest in why Emily had done what she had done. She had taken his daughter from him and her daughter from her father. The girl had grown up in an orphanage because of her, and there was no excuse for it, nor could there be. To disinherit and Max, Matthew conducted an examination, as a result of which it was proved that he was not his son. After that, the man immediately made a new will. Of course, all friends and business partners were shocked by what was happening. They could not imagine what was going on in Matthew's family. Everything was so orderly and honorable. And then this came out. A lot of people sympathized with him. But there were those who thought he shouldn't have brought it out. But Matthew didn't care what they thought. The most important thing for him was to get back on his feet. After the man solved all the problems with his family, he decided to get busy with his treatment. Daddy, I'll go with you, Ellen said when Matthew had made arrangements with the clinic abroad. If you don't mind, I'll take care of you. She was happy to have found her father and to know who her parents were, that she had a family. Not every orphanage is so lucky. Ellen was lucky. She listened with interest to Matthew's stories about her mother, whom he himself knew very little about. Ellen immediately went to her grave and to the girl who had been buried in her place. And who would have thought that behind your birth there was such horror? Vivian sighed when Ellen told her all about it. What kind of an infestation could do such a thing? There are no words. And all for what? Money. People like that, Emily, they've ruined your life and your father's. He was lucky enough to get involved with her, and her son's just like her. As they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's exactly what their family is like. Nothing sacred. Ellen didn't feel she had the right to judge Emily. She did what she thought was right and proper. Of course, a highly moral and spiritually evolved person wouldn't do such a thing, but she never was. Max can still have his own life and future, if he, of course, dares to separate from his mother and not take an example not from her, but from his own father. He is just a promiscuous major who used to cling to his mother's skirt and live on everything ready-made. But sooner or later, life will definitely correct this. It just takes time for him to realize everything. Ellen was sure of that. But Matthew doubted very much that Max, who had been raised by Emily and inherited not only her deceit and duplicity but also Vincent's, would ever be a normal person. But he was wrong. The man resumed his relationship with his adopted son only after his return from abroad. By then, Matthew was back on his feet. The doctors were able to correct the severe consequences of Vincent's accident. Max was impressed by the fact that his own father had organized this terrible tragedy. At first, he couldn't even believe it. 
Yes, the young man was greedy, lazy and very greedy for money peculiarities of upbringing. But to make an attempt on a man's life such a thing did not fit in his head. He thought for a long time about everything that had happened and came to the conclusion that his mother had done a wrong and unacceptable act. He'd always thought of Matthew as his father. The young man didn't need a father like Vincent. Emily took her son's position in stride. There was a serious rift between Emily and Max. For the first time in many years, the woman was sure that her son will always be on her side. Max's desire to resume relations with her husband who left her, Emily perceived as a betrayal. However, at that moment, Max was not up to it. He decided to start life with a clean slate to get a job, rent an apartment and separate from his mother. Now, no one could impose their will on him, tell him what to do and control his fate. But from now on, he was his own master. And this sense of dignity and complete, unrestricted independence was the best thing he had ever experienced in his life. After much persuasion from Helen, Matthew finally agreed to forgive Max and maintain relations with him. Although initially the man was reluctant to do so, he did not understand why his daughter so defends and protects the man who once behaved with her impermissibly. And Helene rejoiced, quite sincerely rejoiced that Max had changed for the better. At certain moments she even caught herself thinking that she liked him. And why not? She reasoned to herself, he's not my brother, we're not related. We have different fathers and mothers. And he's a good guy, really changed and became a decent man. When they got married, Emily, who was not even invited to the wedding, thought that her son did it on purpose. Some time after the wedding, the woman sprung Max on the street and praised him for how smart and thoughtful he was, and also hinted at the fact that it would not hurt to share the money with mom and dad, who need it so much. The woman has not communicated with her son for so long that she did not know about the fact that Max began to build his own business separately from Matthew. Not without his financial help, of course. But he was working really hard. Maxim was working his ass off for the future, for his family, for the children that would soon be born. He was sure of that. But the young man was finally disappointed in his mother, who never understood anything. However, it was not so important. He saw no point in explaining to her the simple truths that can be understood only by feeling them on his own skin. It had happened to him, which Max was very happy about. He considered the realization, recognition and correction of his mistakes to be the most important event in his life. But that doesn't happen to everyone. And Emily was one of those to whom realization never came. She lived with Vincent, angry at her ex-husband and son, whom she considered traitors, but never realized how wrong she'd been. She didn't feel any guilt for what she'd done, nor did Vincent. The only thing he was worried about was that Matthew wouldn't reopen the investigation and put him behind bars. Of course, the man wasn't going to do that. He got to his feet and forgot everything that had happened to him. As a terrible dream, he crossed out of his life and memory Emily, who took away his only daughter, because of whom he almost once and for all lost Max, whom for many years he considered his son.